All right, welcome back everybody. We are now moving into our next section, section number 14, understanding wireless principles. Obviously Wi-Fi was something that we had previously in a separate CCNP certification, CCNP wireless, but now we've incorporated uh, the wireless technology into the CCNP enterprise. So we're gonna spend quite a bit of time in this section talking about uh, basic wireless fundamental principles, uh, specifically Wi-Fi fundamental technology. We'll talk about all of the layer one concepts, uh, basically the radio frequency spectrum, how that spectrum works, the different types of antennas that are used in wireless communication, the electrical and electronics engineers 802.11 standard uh, that wireless clients have to comply with to communicate over a wireless network and so on. So we'll talk about uh, RF or radio frequency principles. We're going to talk about watts and decibels uh, and the relationship, especially in the 802.11 space. And then we're going to talk about different types of antennas in this section here. We're also going to describe all of the different IEEE wireless standards, even some beyond what they go through in the scope of this particular uh, lecture as well, or at least the Cisco curriculum. Uh, and then finally, we'll identify all of our wireless comp uh, component roles in the Cisco unified wireless or, uh, or converged wireless, depending on the term that you see. But there is a, a difference from Cisco's perspective about unified wireless versus converged wireless. Converged wireless doesn't really technically exist anymore. But we'll talk about the wireless component roles uh, and specifically what are some of the technologies that we see in the wireless world. We're also going to take a look at examining wireless deployment options, understanding how wireless roaming and location services work. These are future sections, by the way. We'll take a look at AP operation further down the line, uh, understanding wireless client authentication, uh, some of the techniques that we use to troubleshoot wireless clients, and so on. So we have quite a bit that we're going to be discussing. In this section, though, we're going to focus on RF principles, describing watts and decibels, looking at the different types of antennas, all the IEEE wireless standards, what are wireless component roles, and then we have a little summary challenge towards the end. Now, one of the first things that we talk about with regard to understanding wireless principles is the concept of the radio frequency spectrum. And that's basically what we're seeing a depiction of here, although this is more representative of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum, but this is a typical diagram that explains kind of the breakdown of this electromagnetic spectrum based on a range of frequencies, which is the spectrum itself of electromagnetic radiation and their respective wavelengths and their photonic energies. So at the heart of any type of wireless communication, we have the physical layer of our communication. And really what we're talking about here is how do we use radio frequency waves to transmit information? So this electromagnetic spectrum or this radio frequency spectrum uh, depicted here uh, identifies how many different devices use radio waves to send information. Now that would be a small, a small slice of this particular output here, but a radio wave itself is really just defined as an electromagnetic field that radiates from a particular sender. That wave is then gonna to propagate to a receiver which receives that energy, uh, somewhat dissipated depending on the type of transmitter and receiver that you might have. Uh, and then we interpret that energy into its a, a, a raw data form and then we can identify those ones and zeros that are being transmitted to allow us to identify the data, right? Light, for example, is an example of an, uh, of an electromagnetic uh, type of energy. The eye interprets the light, uh, that energy is sent to the brain, which in turn transforms that light into impressions of colors, and then our synapses get firing and we're able to identify what it is that we're visually seeing. Now, as I previously stated, the electromagnetic spectrum really is, is kind of the, the, the whole range, if you will. Uh, it covers electromagnetic magnetic waves with frequencies uh, below one hertz all the way up to basically 10 to the power of 25 hertz, 
which correspond to wavelengths from thousands of kilometers long down to a fraction of the size of basically an atomic nucleus, if you will. All right. So this, this spectrum is divided up into separate bands uh, and the electromagnetic magnetic waves within each frequency band are uh, represented by different types of names. Uh, in the low frequencies, which is, which is our, essentially our long wavelength of the scale, uh, we call those radio waves or microwaves or infrared light or visible light all the way up to ultraviolet light x-rays and then finally at ga uh, gamma rays at the very high end of the scale uh, going from a very long radio frequency wave to a very high radio frequency wave uh, the electromagnetic waves in each of these bands are going to have different characteristics how are they produced how do they interact with our space around us how do they interact with the the matter that they have to pass through and really, what is the practical application of the use of those particular radio frequencies or that electromagnet electromagnetic transmission? Now, theoretically speaking, the, the limit for any kind of long wavelength is really the size of the universe itself. Uh, obviously, that's a pretty generic statement, but that, that really is, uh, is very, very true. Uh, short wavelengths, on the other hand, uh, is, uh, is based on a principle called the Planck length. We don't really need to get into the specifics of that in this particular class. This is not a phys physics class, but uh, there is a, um, uh, a principle that those higher frequencies are going to have uh, some limitations that the lower frequencies might not have. In most of the frequency bands, uh, there is a technique called spectroscopy that can be used uh, to essentially physically separate waves into different types of frequencies, which then allows us to produce this spectrum, which we see that, const uh, that, that are basically the, the constitu con <laughs> constituents excuse me, of those particular frequencies. All right, so basically spectroscopy is the kind of what we're doing here, it's the study of interactions of electromagnetic waves in matter and space and so on. Now, obviously, in this particular class, the blue box that represents wireless networks, you know, this is kind of where we're going to sit in this particular case. We don't really uh, see much in terms of networking outside of really this, this kind of space right here. So we're going to focus most of our attention on that aspect of the, the uh, communication in this particular case. All right. Now there is uh, essentially what we call regions or bands or types of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, and they're broadly kind of classified into different classes. Uh, on the left side, we have our radio waves. We have our microwave uh, uh, transmission kind of in the middle there around the 10 gigahertz uh, frequency. We have our ultraviolet uh, radiation. We have our visible light uh, radiation. Uh, excuse me, the other way around. Excuse me. Visible light would come obviously prior to the ultraviolet radiation. Then we have our X-ray radiation and then finally our gamma radiation. Uh, obviously, we can see here that this classification is really based on the order of the wavelength, which is the characteristic of that particular type of radiation. There, we don't really have any kind of very specific, precisely defined boundaries between the bands of electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, they kind of fade into each other, uh, almost like a, a rainbow effect, if you will. We can kind of see the different colors listed here. Although this diagram does tend to uh, kind of indicate that there's a hard stop say between uh, amplitude modulation and uh, frequency modulation and TV in between and so on. But really there's just kind of this uh, undefined, uh, not very precise boundary between the, uh, the frequencies. Uh, the radiation of each frequency, the wavelength in each band has different properties of those regions uh, of the spectrum that's bound to that particular frequency. Red light, for example, uh, resembles infrared radiation in, in that it uh, 
uh, creates these kind of chemical bonds uh, for photosynthesis and the working of uh, visual systems and so on. Again, we don't really need to get into the specifics of that, right? The distinction, for example, between X-rays and gamma rays uh, is based on, uh, you know, whether or not they're generated from a particular source. For example, photons that are generated from nuclear decay or other nuclear or subnuclear particle processes, those are termed gamma rays. That's where all of our superheroes get their powers from whereas X-rays are ge generally generated by electronic transitions uh, for um, you know, highly energetic, if you will, atomic electrons and so on. Again, we don't need to get into the physics of it, but there is kind of a, a similarity, but there's also a difference between those, those uh, uh, frequencies. All right. So the names themselves, uh, uh, the region of the spectrum, if you will, the radio region, for example, uh, carries, uh, you know, kind of longer wavelength information over radio frequency signals, uh, microwave, uh, near infrared uh, communication, visible light, ultraviolet X-rays, etc. Uh, they're going to get their different types of of information or the their, their different applications, if you will, of these different types of electromagnetic uh, uh, generated frequencies, all right, or, or uh, energy, if I, I should probably use the right term, energy, okay? So we're going to focus, obviously, most of our, care, uh, our time focusing on the wireless spectrum. That's what this portion of the course is all about, 802.11 wireless. Uh, we, we don't really get into... Uh, microwave transmissions and so on, even though those are widely used as well in the wireless world. All right. But again, most of these waves, they're going to have different sizes. They're going to be expressed in meters. Uh, uh, you know, we'll talk about the relationship between hertz and, and uh, radio frequencies and, and cycles of a radio wave and so on when we start to get into some of the terminology a little bit later on. Now, one of the first principles that we're going to talk about uh, with regard to defining all of these parameters of this electromagnetic spectrum is something called frequency. Frequency is measured in hertz, or hz. Uh, the book says here, a wave is always sent at the speed of light because it is an electromagnetic field, so therefore the wave takes a shorter or longer time to travel one cycle depending on its length. And that's kind of what you see depicted here in terms of frequency. Uh, Hertz itself is a derived unit of frequency in the uh, international system of units, uh, and it's defined as one cycle per second. Uh, the name, as, uh, uh, as it's called, is actually named after Heinrich Rudolf Hertz, who was the first person to actually provide any kind of conclusive proof of the existence of these electromagnetic waves that we're actually talking about. All right, hertz are expressed in multiples, if you will. It could be kilohertz, uh, which is 10 to the power of 3 hertz. It could be megahertz, which is 10 to the power of 6 hertz. It could be gigahertz, for example, which is 10 to the power of 9 hertz, terahertz, uh, petahertz, and exahertz, and so on. Even all the way up to zeta hertz, which is 10 to the power of 21. So uh, the unit is, uh, is often used to describe sine waves, um, particularly those that are used in radio transmissions, which is what we're talking about in this particular case. Uh, and it allows us to identify the cycle, if you will, of the particular waveform. Again, how long does it take to go from one crest to the other crest, which represents the cycle uh, in, uh, in a, in a timestamp of one second, by the way. So for example, if you look at the green line here, we can see that we have three crests, which indicate uh, that we've gone through two different cycles within a one second period. So that would represent two hertz. Uh, the blue line there, we see one, two, three, four crests, which indicate that we've gone through four cycles within a one second period. So that would be four hertz and 7 hertz and so on. 
So relating this back to what we talked about previously, electromagnetic radiation is described by its frequency, typically by the number of oscillations of the perpendicular electric and magnetic fields per second. And that's why this term is so important to understand. So radio frequency radiation typically is going to be, like I said, measured in kilohertz or megahertz or gigahertz. Uh, light is actually a form of electromagnetic radi radiation that operates at that even higher frequency range uh, and tens to thousands of hertz or, or terahertz and so on. All right, electromagnetic radiation with frequencies that fall in the low terahertz range. Uh, for example, long wave infrared light uh, is typically referred to as maybe something like terahertz radiation. Even higher frequencies exist based on the, uh, the, the spectrum that we, we saw previously. All right, even in computers, the CPU, that central processing unit, is going to be labeled in terms of its clock rate. That clock rate is expressed in megahertz or gigahertz, uh, and that basically refers to the frequency of the CPU's master clock signal. Um, it's not necessarily a sine wave. It is a square wave, uh, which switches between low and high logic values, representing essentially the, the binary positions in a computing environment. Now, a direct relationship always exists between the frequency of the signal, how often that signal is seen, and the wavelength of that particular signal, which is the distance that the signal travels in one particular cycle. The shorter the wavelength, the more often the signal repeats itself over that period of time, meaning that it's going to be operating at a higher frequency. For example, a signal that occurs one million times per second is the megahertz. A signal that occurs one billion times per second is gigahertz. Uh, this obviously plays a role when we talk about wi uh, wireless uh, networks and Wi-Fi networks because lower frequency signals are going to be less affected by the media, by the air, than our higher frequency signals. So going back to some of the original standards, 802.11b, uh, for example, which operated at 2.4 gigahertz, uh, was less susceptible to loss or attenuation traveling through walls and air and, and whatnot, as opposed to, say, 802.11a, which operated in the 5 gigahertz range. All right? You, uh, uh, everybody's done the little elementary school science experiment where sound waves, uh, you know, from a, a music playing from a car, the first sound that you always hear are, are the, the low tones of the music, the bass and so on. And then uh, as you get closer and closer, you start to hear the higher tones themselves. Now, the next principle that we talk about is wavelength. Uh, wavelength is, is uh, basically the spatial period, if you will, of a periodic wave. Uh, think of it like the distance where the wave shape repeats. All right, the distance between consecutive corresponding points of the same phase of the wave, like two adjacent crests or two adjacent troughs, or even the zero crossing points, kind of the middle, if you will, of the wave itself, uh, of the traveling wave or the standing wave and the wave pattern. All right, the inverse of a wavelength, by the way, is the spatial frequency, but we're not going to talk about that specifically. Uh, wavelength is always measured by a symbol called lambda. Uh, it's not really identified well in the document here. Uh, you might see it in some of the text, but the lambda symbol is a Greek symbol. The wavelength is uh, typically going to be applied to modulated waves, uh, sine waves, and so on. Now, the wavelength itself is going to depend on the type of medium that you're passing through. Maybe it's a vacuum or air or water, uh, whatever that wave is going to travel through. Uh, sound waves, light, water waves, electro, uh, electrical signals, for example, in a conductor, uh, uh, and so on. Sound waves, as an example, not what we use typically to transmit our, our data, are variations of air pressure. 
Uh, light would be electromagnetic radiation. Uh, and in electricity, it's the magnetic fields that we generate that differentiate between different types of waves. Uh, water, it could be the crests and troughs of the height of the body of the water, and so on. Now, the range of uh, wavelengths or frequencies of wave is where we get back to that original topic that we discussed, which is the spectrum itself. All right. Uh, the electromagnetic spectrum really includes or encompasses everything. Now, in terms of what we're doing in the wireless world, the RF signal or the radio frequency signal that we're generating is done with an electrical AC signal that a particular transmitter generates. So we have an access point here that has some sort of transmitter, some sort of uh, connection here, if you will, and we're going to connect that uh, to a cable that eventually goes to an antenna so that we can generate the radio frequency signal. Uh, that signal gets sent through that cable where the signal uh, essentially gets radiated in the form of uh, electromagnetic wireless signals, right? Uh, and that's what passes through the air and allows us to identify on the receiving side what the data is on the other side, right? And then we do the reverse process. We, we receive that uh, radiated electromagnetic wireless signal, and then we convert it back into some sort of electrical signal on the other side. All right. This is called the current, if you will. And we produce changes in the electromagnetic field around the antenna, and we transmit the electric and magnetic fields. We'll see later on, perhaps in this section or maybe another uh, advanced section later on, that these radio frequency signals or these signals, these wireless signals that are being generated have specific properties. They have amplitude properties, they have wavelength properties, they have um, uh, polarization properties as well. These signals can be polarized uh, on a vertical axis, I mean on a uh, vertical axis or a horizontal axis. Uh, or even in a, a spiral form. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, but the size of the cycle pattern of the electromagnetic wave is what we're referring to in this case as the wavelength. You might look at this and go, well, isn't this Hertz? No, because remember, Hertz is based on time. Hertz is the number of cycles or the number of wavelengths that we go through within a one second period. Cycle is more of a generic term that describes uh, those two points of common interest, like the two crests or the two troughs or the two zero crossings. But wavelength is the actual measurement of the space of those crests or those troughs or those zero crossing points, right? So this AC uh, current, this alternating current, is basically just an electrical current where the direction of the current changes cyclically, right? We have two different ways of providing power uh, in a system, uh, direct current where electrons flow, uh, or alternating current where we're actually changing the direction of those electrons cyclically, right? The shape of uh, and the form of that alternating current signal, which is our waveform, that's what generates the sine wave. The shape is the same as the signal that the antenna radiates. All right, now we're gonna talk about antenna theory a little bit later on. 99.999% uh, .999 of the time, uh, contrary to popular belief because antennas are measured in terms of gain, these are passive amplifiers, meaning that they focus the radiated signal in a particular direction. The beam width or the focus of the pattern Gener or, or directly corresponds or relates to the amplit or the the uh, um, the gain of that particular antenna. We'll get into that a little bit later on as we talk about antenna theory. Okay. The physical distance that we have from one point of the cycle to the same point in the next cycle, that's our wavelength. That's what these lines represent. Uh, the green line, for example, has a long wavelength. The blue uh, sine wave has a medium wavelength, and the orange sine wave has a short wavelength. 
All right, again, measured uh, or, or at least uh, documented with the Greek symbol lambda. The wavelength is, de uh, is defined as the physical distance that a wave covers in one cycle. But again, that's not hertz. Hertz would represent how many of those cycles we have per second. All right. The wavelength distance determines very important and critical properties of the wave, right? Oftentimes we're transmitting these signals uh, in open space or over the air. It has to pass through obstacles. It has to pass through trees or walls, uh, or it could actually bounce off of physical objects. But certain environments have obstacles that can affect the overall quality of the wave. And it will impact to a certain degree uh, the, the, uh, what we call the attenuation of that particular wave, meaning loss as the signal passes through space or through objects and so on. All right. We'll actually cover that degree of loss and that degree of impact a little bit later on in this particular lesson here. All right. Now, another principle that we see, uh, which is a fairly straightforward principle to understand, is amplitude. Amplitude is a way for us to identify the strength of the signal, all right? Meaning that the, the loudness, if you will, of the signal. Oftentimes, we have to identify a signal in a noisy environment. A lower amplitude signal would be, le uh, would be more difficult to differentiate from the noise if the noise floor was very similar to our signal floor. Right? So we increase amplitude, uh, our, our RSSI, if you will, received signal strength uh, value. Uh, well, we don't really increase it. It's a measured value. But the, uh, that signal strength is, is a direct rate relation to that amplitude. Uh, amplitude has nothing to do with the crest. It has nothing to do with frequency, how often the crests occur within a second. Uh, it has nothing to do with the actual wavelength. It simply has to do with the, uh, the height of each of the, the sine wave patterns. We use a Greek symbol, uh, gamma. That's our common representation of amplitude. Amplitude affects the signal because it basically represents the level of energy that gets injected into one cycle. The more energy that we can inject into one cycle, the higher the amplitude. Okay? Amplification is done either actively or passively. Uh, most access points do active amplification where they're gonna increase the amplitude of the wave. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, we basically are applying power, if you will, to generate that increase. Whereas passive amplification, which is what most antennas do in a wireless environment, simply focus the energy in one particular direction by using that, uh, that antenna. All right. We can also decrease amplitude, uh, which is a direct relation to the term attenuation. Attenuation is a term that is synonymous with loss, if you will. Uh, and uh, these values are actually regulated by most industries, or at least most in most countries. We don't want somebody generating a wireless signal with a massive amount of amplitude that would in turn then uh, uh, you know, interfere or create uh, interference with other weaker signals in the, in the same environment, right? Now, if the signal is very weak, it's going to weaken, obviously. We'll, talk, we'll talk about free path loss, and we'll talk about other types of attenuation a little bit later on. But as the signal moves away from the emitter, the things that don't change are the frequency. We're not changing the wavelength. We're not changing the, the cycles per second, but we are losing amplitude, all right? So if we're far enough away from the transmitter or the antenna or the source of the signal, when that signal arrives at the receiver side, the receiver may not be able to interpret the data or be able to even differentiate the actual signal from whatever noise might exist in that particular environment. If the signal is too strong, uh, it has a whole bunch of energy. Uh, it can damage the actual receiver, like physically damage the actual receiver. 
So we do have regulations in Europe, the ETSI, and in the United States, the FCC regulate the amount of power that should be used for a wireless system. We call that the effective isotropic radio power. We'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. All right. Uh, and then we also have uh, the ISM bands, the industrial and scientific and medical bands, which are uh, kind of open, open bands that are unregulated. Well, I wouldn't say unregulated. They're unlicensed, right? They're still regulated to an extent. Uh, and then we have the licensed bands, which gives you a lot more flexibility on how to transmit signals. All right. So we'll talk about that uh, as we kind of get into our, our math and so on. Uh, that's, a, that's an important concept to understand. Uh, relationships between watts and decibels and antenna characteristics uh, and then also the standards bodies and how they regulate that information. Now a next uh, principle or the next concept that we're going to talk about is free path loss. Uh, in, in the world of telecommunications, uh, particularly wireless networks, uh, you might see this referred to as FPL or free path loss or we often see it referred to as free space path loss, or FSPL. Uh, but it is, in essence, the attenuation of the radio energy between the feed points of the different antennas that results in a combination of basically the receiving antenna's capture area plus that line of sight obstacle free path through free space, which is typically air, right? Uh, in um, the standard uh, definitions of terms for antennas, uh, which I believe uh, is IEEE 145-1993, I'm pretty sure that's what it is, uh, um, it, the, the free space loss uh, is defined as basically the loss between two isotropic radiators in free space uh, and it's going to be represented as a power ratio. I'm not quoting that, but I'm paraphrasing it, right? It does not include any power loss in the antennas themselves, uh, resistance of the cables, the connectors, and so on. Uh, it's just basically a representation of the, uh, the loss through free space, air, right? We're not talking about transmitting through trees or or over a mountain or through buildings and whatnot, we're literally talking about free space path loss. Now, free space path loss or free space loss increases uh, with the square of the distance between the antennas because those radio waves are not, they don't have a zero degree beam width. They're actually spread out um, and we use the inverse square law to represent that, which uh, uh, decreases with the square of the wavelength of the radio waves. Uh, in essence, we're going to see loss no matter what. All right. Now, there is a factor uh, that is included in the power link budget of any radio communication system. Uh, and it's part of the, the overall effective isotropic radio power calculation that we'll talk about a little bit later on to make sure that we have enough radio power to reach the receiver uh, and we can actually identify what that signal uh, is, uh, is going to be on the other side. All right, now there are two uh, things that we need to consider uh, when we talk about the influence of free path loss. Uh, it's going to be the intensity or the power density of the radio waves, which, by the way, are going to decrease with the square of the distance from the transmitting antenna, and then the antenna capture area. All right. Now, we don't need to get into the specific uh, physics of it, the calculation. For this class, you really just need to understand the principles that we're talking about here and not necessarily the, the math behind the principles. All right. But uh, the radio wave is going to transmit. Now, imagine, if you will, in this particular diagram, and, and this has to do with uh, antenna theory as well, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on. But imagine, if you will, that you have this, this uh, uh, access point with an omnidirectional antenna that is transmitting a signal. Okay, 
And let's say that we take uh, measurements or points of interest along this circle here. So we've got all these points of interest along this circle that uh, identify essentially the ideal capture point of the wave. Uh, as you get closer to the axis point, those points are closer together, which means you have a very uh, low signal to noise ratio and a high uh, uh, signal strength. But as you move out, you don't increase the number of points, so you're increasing the space between those points, which means, which is a, a direct relation then to uh, attenuation or loss. So as you get further away from the transmitter, these points uh, that represent the ideal uh, uh, place to receive the signal or whatnot, they start to get further and further apart. That's why you'll see, for example, a scenario in which a focused antenna, uh, a focused antenna will narrow that beam width so those points don't spread apart too much as you move that signal to the, to the receiving side and the receiving antenna. Uh, so if you have, for example, some sort of omnidirectional antenna that has a very narrow beam width, those points are very close together here, and as you move further down the line, they are further apart, but they don't have the chance to, ch uh, to, to separate as much. Uh, and that's where you get the gain uh, in an antenna itself, is by the focus of the, the signal itself. Now you could install active amplifiers and so on to increase the overall signal strength or the amplitude, uh, but uh, passive gain is derived from the antenna and how it's used. All right. Now, there are other types of loss to consider, of course. Right? We have loss of as we pass through objects and so on, but right now we're just talking about uh, what happens to the radio wave as it's transmitted through the air. Uh, in this particular diagram, the antenna is omnidirectional. That signal, like I said, is going to get transmitted in all directions. Uh, and as the radio wave radiates outward from the point where the signal was generated, uh, we start to get less and less data points in that signal itself. All right. Uh, basically, uh, Outside of free path loss, we have other obstacle-based loss, which is going to also direct in, uh, directly result in attenuation of the signal itself. All right, so even if I'm not encountering any obstacle, the wave if propagation is going to be affected. All right, the attenuation of the signal strength uh, going from the transmitter uh, and the receiver, that is that free path loss that we're talking about. The word free itself is the expression that, that refers to the fact that the loss of energy is simply a result of the distance, not of any obstacles in the path. All right. So including this word in the term is really important, that free word, because as you study uh, radio frequency spectrums and as you t study propagation of radio frequency waves you need to understand the impact of that path loss not only the loss directly related to obstacles but also the loss that's related to the air okay now keep in mind what causes free path loss is actually not the distance itself all right i erased all my dots here but this is the concept that the book describes that I, I think uh, visually you saw previously. There is actually no real physical reason why the signal is weaker further away from the source. All right. That cause of loss is actually a combination of two different things. The signal gets sent from the emitter in all directions, as we see in this particular diagram. That energy that's being generated by the antenna has to be distributed over a larger area as you move away from the center circle. But the amount of energy, the actual energy that was originally sent is not changing in this case. So the amount of energy that's available at each point of the circle 
would be much higher if the circle is concentrated and small, right, than if the circle is larger as the points move away from each other because the energy, again, has to be divided over a much larger area. The second component is the receiver antenna, right? Receiver antennas have a certain physical size. And we're talking about capturing visually, at least, those data points on the circle. The amount of energy that is being collected depends on the size of the antenna. A very large antenna collects more points on the circle than a small antenna. Regardless of the size, the antenna cannot pick up more than a portion of the original signal, uh, especially if we're talking about three-dimensional propagation uh, and so on. So the rest of that signal, which isn't picked up by the antenna, is ultimately going to be lost. All right. Now, the combination of both factors is what results in free path loss. If somehow we could take that energy and we could emit that energy toward in a single direction, and if the receiver could catch 100% of the signal that was sent, there would be no loss at any distance because there's nothing along the path to absorb any of that signal strength. We're not, I mean, I'm not even talking about the atmosphere, right? And, and uh, uh, you know, when we talk about like a space shuttle coming in from space, the vacuum of space into the atmosphere, the friction that gets generated, we don't see those same kind of things happening with uh, the, in the electromagnetic spectrum. All right. Uh, and we'll get into the, the, the antenna characteristics a little bit later on, but some antennas are built to focus, like a Yagi antenna, for example, to focus the signal as much as possible to try and send that powerful signal uh, uh, over a large distance to the other AP. But that focus is still not like a laser beam. There's still uh, some, some angle of uh, transmission. All right, uh, so the receiver still can't capture up to 100% of whatever was sent. All right, so that describes some of those principles. Now let's talk about another concept that's important to understand, RSSI versus SNR, okay? Because the radio frequency wave is going to be affected, because we're going to see loss, it's very important to to be able to identify how much of the signal the endpoint is actually going to receive so that signal can be then interpreted and, and generated into the ones and zeros that we need to be able to represent the data. If the signal is too weak, uh, the receiver might not be able to differentiate that signal from noise. And that's where we get into this discussion about signal to noise ratio. Now, one of the terms that we use to describe the signal, especially in telecom, is what we call the received signal strength indicator, or RSSI. This is basically a measurement of the amount of power that we receive on the receiving side. Uh, it's actually not very technically calculated, and there's some discussion about that. We'll talk about some of that in a little bit here. All right. RSSI is usually something that's invisible to the user on the device that's receiving the signal. Uh, because the signal strength varies greatly, uh, depending on the, the implementation of wireless, right? In 802.11, uh, we do have this measurement available to us, uh, but it's not a scientific measurement. It's not a calculable value. It's, a, it's an estimated value. And I'm, I'm going to talk about what I mean by that in a minute. Okay, RSSI is, is often derived from intermediate frequency stages uh, before we get into the IF amplifier. But in terms of wireless networking, we don't really concern ourselves with that too much. Let's talk about it, what it, how it specific re relates, specifically relates to 802.11. It is a relatively conceived value. RSSI is a relatively conceived signal strength indicator in a wireless environment. It's actually defined 
with an arbitrary unit. All right. Now, the general purpose of RSSI is to provide some indication of the power level that's being received by the receiving radio after the antenna, after cable loss, etc. So, in essence, the greater the RSSI value, that directly is going to correlate to the stronger the signal. All right. So when the RSSI value is represented, it's actually represented in a negative form, typically, uh, like minus 90 or minus 80 or whatever. As the value gets closer to zero, that represents a stronger received signal. All right. So you might see a minus 50, a minus 70, whatever. The RSSI value is going to indicate, uh, based on that scale, what the stronger value is. All right, now RSSI can actually be used internally in a wireless network to determine when the amount of radio energy in the channel falls below a certain threshold. Uh, and at that point, actually what happens is the network card uh, is, is uh, basically clear to send, right? Once the card is clear to send, the packet of information can be sent and so on. In fact, let me pull up uh, a tool that allows me to measure RSSI. So here's an example of a tool. Uh, there are many tools available, but Insider uh, or NSSIDER uh, is just another, is, is just one of those tools that uh, is available to us to scan the radio frequency spectrum or the wireless spectrum, if you will. You can see these are all the different SSIDs that uh, uh, are kind of in my area um, uh, presently. These are the radio MAC addresses, the channels that they're operating on. Uh, but this is the signal strength here, and it's measured in uh, dBMs or decibels per milliwatt, decibels in reference to milliwatt. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But again, as we get closer to zero, that's going to indicate the best or the, the, the uh, strongest signal, if you will. Uh, if I get uh, further away, uh, minus 87, for example, would be something that's relatively not usable in, in this particular case. We can see the different uh, physical layer uh, spectrum information here as well. All right, but we can see these uh, the signals. This is another uh, chart, if you will, that represents these uh, spectrums in the, in the A spectrum or in the 5 gigahertz spectrum and the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. We're seeing... Uh, you know, relatively strong signals. These are from my local uh, access points and so on. All right, this happens to be the one that I'm actually connected to. All right, so RSSI, like I said, is, is a way for us to effectively measure uh, that signal strength. All right, there is no standardization though, uh, and no standard relationship uh, for any particular physical parameter to the RSSI value. In fact, the 802.11 standard doesn't even define any specific relationship between the RSSI value and the power level in either milliwatts or decibels in reference to a milliwatt dBMs as we saw in the scale. Vendors and different wireless manufacturers provide their own accuracy, their own granularity and their own actual measured value of those dBMs, decibels in reference to milliwatts, and their RSSI values from zero to the RSSI maximum value. All right. One subtlety of the 802.11 RSSI metric comes from how it's actually sampled. RSSI is actually acquired during only the preamble stage of receiving an 802.11 frame and not over the entire frame. All right. So uh, RSSI doesn't always provide measurements that are sufficiently accurate to really properly determine either location and so on. But it still represents the most feasible indication for localization purposes and so on, even though it might not be nearly as accurate. For the most part, uh, RSSI has been replaced these days 
with something called RCPI. Uh, RCPI stands for Received Channel Power Indicator. Now this is actually an 802.11 measurement of the received radio frequency power in a particular channel, not only over the preamble, but the entire received frame. Uh, and it actually defines absolute levels of accuracy and resolution. Uh, it is something that is specifically seen with 802.11. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, was introduced in uh, 802.11K 2008. Um, but we know that this is something that is really critical because it allows us to assess the location of devices and uh, the quality of the link and so on based on a much more accurate and measured value. So just the takeaway here is it's a grade value, all right? Uh, and typically it's gonna be 100 or 60 or some other value. Um, and, and again, I cannot reiterate this enough. This is a value that is relative uh, because a magnetic field and an electric field get received. Uh, a transistor transforms them into electrical power, but current is not directly received. Okay, so it is a relative value. How much electric power can be generated depends on the received fields and the circuit that's actually transforming that into a current. All right, but this grade value, this RSSI grade value, uh, equivalent uh, or, or is measured in DBMs and that's going to get displayed. It really is going to depend on the vendor. All right, one vendor, for example, might determine that the RSSI for a card will range from 0 to 100 and 0, repre uh, zero is represented as minus 95 DBM and 100 is as minus 15 DBM, DBM. And another vendor might determine that the range will be from 0 to 60. And zero in this case is represented as minus two dBm and 60 is minus 12 dBm. Uh, in this case, you really cannot compare the RSSI reading uh, uh, from one product to the other. If, if we have minus 35 dBm, dBm on one product and minus 28 dBm on the other product, you might say, well, that other product uh, or that other device has a better signal. You can't really say that, all right? Now, because this is a Cisco class, we focus primarily on Cisco technology. Good RSSI values in the Cisco world would be anywhere from minus 67 dBm uh, or all the way down to you know zero in essence, right? Anything less would be a, a better value. So minus 55 dBm or minus 4 dBm and so on. So RSSI is not a way for us to compare cards. It's a way for us to help uh, uh, to understand uh, vendor by vendor and manufacturer by manufacturer how strong a received signal is relative to itself in different locations. So you could use a, a, a laptop or whatever to scan the wireless uh, or the radio frequency spectrum. As long as you're comparing apples to apples, you can be able to identify the, um, the space, if you will. All right, I already mentioned RCPI. Uh, and so on. Now, one of the other things that we'll talk about is SNR. Uh, SNR is the signal to noise ratio. All right. Think about this analogy. So if I'm in a crowded room and everybody is speaking and they're all speaking loudly and I'm trying to speak as well, one might not be able to differentiate between my speech and somebody else's speech in the room because the amplitude of my speech is equivalent or maybe even just a slightly higher amplitude than those that are speaking around me. So it's like very difficult. It's like trying to communicate to somebody in a dance club, right? Or a nightclub with the loud music and everything else. It's nearly impossible, right? Because the uh, signal around you is much higher than the signal that you're trying to generate. So if I'm in the same room and I've got the 100 people or 200 people and they're all quiet, I don't necessarily have to speak at a loud volume for people to understand what I'm generating, the, the information that I'm generating, which defines the noise floor, right, or the noise level. 
So the signal to noise ratio is a relationship between the RSSI or the signal strength and that noise floor. All right. SNR is uh, really just a way for us to evaluate the signal and that's based on the noise that's seen in the environment. Typically this is going to be measured as a positive integer, uh, usually between 0 and 120, uh, and the closer the value is to 120, the better. If you think about it, it is a ratio. Receive signal divided by the noise. If the noise is high, that integer is going to be much lower, 10 divided by 8, for example, versus the noise being lower, 10 divided by 1. So the higher the number, the lower the, the noise floor is, and the higher the signal is in relation to the noise floor. All right, so we're comparing those two values, the RSSI and the noise. We basically just subtract the noise from the RSSI. Usually both are going to be expressed as negative integers, uh, which is going to result in a positive number expressed in decibels. All right, so for example, let's say that the RSSI is minus 55 dBm and the noise is minus 95 dBm, okay? So I take minus 55 and I subtract minus 95, which means I'm basically taking minus 55 plus 95, which results in an SNR value of 40. So we have a, we have a SNR value of 40 dBs in this particular case. Anything generally above uh, 20 dBs is considered good. All right. Now, the values themselves depend not only on the background noise, but also on the speed that we need to achieve. All right. An example that the book describes is everyday life when someone speaks in a room, right? And I kind of gave you that example. Uh, uh, but they went a little bit further, right? They said, if I speak in a room, it's easier than if I'm speaking outside with a lot of ambient noise, but I use the kind of a, a similar analogy, all right? In a very, very quiet room, I could speak relatively at, with low amplitude and you'd still be able to understand. All right, so current calculations, we use the signal to interference plus noise ratio, uh, which is the SINR. Uh, and that takes into account the noise floor and the strength of any interference to the signal, right? Which may not be direct noise, but it could be some other interferer that's uh, a non-Wi-Fi interferer and so on. Uh, an SINR value of 25 or better is typically required in our wireless networks. Okay? So let's take a look at some of the questions at the end of this section here. What is the frequency of a radio wave that cycles 1,000 times per second? Quite simply, 1,000 hertz. Remember, one cycle per second is one hertz, so 1,000 cycles per second is 1,000 hertz. How is the radio wavelength measured? Right? Typically, that's going to be measured as the distance between one crest and another crest, or one trough and another trough, or one zero crossing and another zero crossing, but it is always going to be measured in terms of meters. All right. All right. Uh, let's see. Match the definition. This one's a little bit more challenging. Match the term with its definition. All right. So let's match the term with its definition. We've got uh, increasing the power and the amplitude of the wave. That is going to be active amplification. Focusing the energy in one direction by an antenna is going to be passive amplification. And then a decrease of power and amplitude of the wave or loss is going to be an attenuation. That's also measured in dBs as well. All right. Uh, what are the two factors of free path loss which causes attenuation? All right. Well, number one, we know that the energy must be distributed in all directions. Uh, reflection, absorption, and multipath would be obstacle-based loss. So distance would be the other choice here. 
A, a third might actually be the size of the receiver as well, but reflection is, is uh, uh, attenuation resulting in uh, the signal bouncing off of different objects. Absorption is uh, obviously like a tree or a water source or a wall absorbing the signal and reducing the amplitude. We're not changing the frequency, we're not changing the wavelength or the cycles, we're changing the amplitude. And then multipath has to do with how the signal uh, is transmitted and then how it arrives out of phase at the, so at the destination, which means that the signal in, in essence starts to cancel itself out. We'll talk about that when we get into our antenna, uh, antenna section a little bit later on. Okay, so match the signal measurement with what it measures. Signal to noise ratio, the amount of interference of your Wi-Fi signal measured in decibels and attempt to unify the grade levels, a ratio based value that evaluates the signal quality based on the amount of noise. So that will go there. RCPIs and attempt to unify grade levels of signal strength, RSSI, uh, the signal strength that one device receives from another device expressed in decibels, and noise is the amount of interference in your Wi-Fi signal measured in decibels. So in our next section, we're gonna talk about the relationship in uh, power, in amplitude and whatnot, in terms of watts and decibels. Uh, one of the key factors in deciding what type of access point to use, what type of antenna to use, the antenna's placement and direction, whether we're using passive or active amplification, is gonna be dependent upon, or is gonna depend on getting the signal from point A to point B. What kind of distances can I achieve depending on the characteristics of the overall wireless system. The power or the amplitude that is sent from the source will determine what types of devices that I need to install, the type of access point that I might use, and the different types of antennas that I'm gonna use. So we're gonna talk about a watt, we're gonna talk about decibels, we're also gonna talk about decibels in reference to other components in the system. But let's first define what a decibel is uh, and how we have a relationship between a decibel and a wireless environment. Now the decibel, term decibel, uh, which is referenced by the little d and the big B, this is going to be a relative unit of measurement which basically corresponds to one-tenth of a bell. We don't really use the term bell anymore. It came from, uh, in reference to Alexander Graham Bell, uh, and there was a, uh, a relationship or a power relationship of 10 to the power of 110, uh, uh, 10 to the power of 1 tenth, I should say. Uh, and, uh, and there's another re relationship, the amplitude ratio. We, we talk about dBs in terms of power ratio, uh, not amplitude ratio. Uh, amplitude ratio would be uh, 10 to the 120th as opposed to 10 to the 110th. So a, a, for example, a, a dB level of 100 would have a power ratio of 10 billion. So uh, we'll talk about the math of this in a little bit. But the whole point of the decibel is to express the ratio of one value of a power field to another. Uh, and this is done, by the way, on a logarithmic scale. You can see the logarithmic scale uh, depicted here in the diagram. Uh, which is basically the power level. If I was talking about amplitude ratios, I'd be talking about the field quality or the field quantity, I should say, and the field levels. But again, we're not talking about this in terms of um, uh, field quantity. We're talking about this in terms of power. Uh, the decibel itself can be used to express a change in the value or it can be used to express an absolute value. Uh, so I could say, okay, plus one dB or minus one dB, which would represent a change in the value. Uh, if I was using this to express an absolute value, uh, the expressed, uh, we express the ratio of a value to a fixed reference. So we will see terms like dBd, which is a decibel in reference to a dipole antenna, a DBI is a de decibel in reference to an isotropic radio antenna, 
a dBm, uh, a decibel in, in reference to a milliwatt, and so on. So the suffix that we use actually indicates the reference value uh, and it gets appended basically to the dB symbol. Uh, I could even say, for example, say dB in reference to one volt. So um, one milliwatt, one volt, and so on. Uh, if I was to do that, then the suffix for, for that would be a V, uh, as, in, as in volt, right? So one milliwatt, uh, the suffix is a, a little m, and so on, all right? There are two different scales, as I've kind of mentioned already a couple of times, when we're that we use when we're expressing a ratio in decibels, depending on the nature of the quantities. Uh, like I said, the power is what we use. Uh, root power is not something that we typically use uh, when we're expressing the power ratio. But in, in, in any regard, it's always the number of decibels, which is 10 times its logarithmic base, or 10 times its logarithm in base 10, I should say. Uh, that is a change uh, in power by a factor of 10 which corresponds to a 10 dB change level, okay? So we actually see the measurements here listed in the diagram. Zero dB uh, would be the same power. Three dB, so if I say it's an increase by three dB, I'm actually multiplying the overall amplitude or power by two. If it's a minus three dB, I'm dividing it in half. If it's a plus 10 dB, I'm going to 10 times the power. And if it's a minus 10 dB, I'm going to one tenth of the power. All right. These are typically, and there, there are scales in between, but these are typically the references that we'll use in our wireless environment. All right. So we, we also talked about the element of a watt. The first unit of power that's used in our power measurement is the watt, which was named after James Watt. The watt is a measure of the energy that gets spent, uh, either transmitted or emitted or consumed per second. So one watt represents one joule of energy per second. Again, you don't really need to know the physics behind it, but that's the, that's the history, if you will. The joule is the amount of energy that's generated by a force of one newton moving one meter in one particular direction. So it's uh, basically the force that's required to, uh, say, for example, accelerate one kilogram at a rate of one meter per second squared. All right. So, again, that's not really important in terms of wireless, but that's the, uh, the, the sixth grade um, uh, representation of the physics behind it. Right. So watts or milliwatts in our case. Uh, in, in the ISM bands, the industrial and scientific and medical bands, we're dealing with milliwatts. This is going to be an absolute power value that simply expresses the amount of power consumption. Uh, so these can be used to compare devices. So for example, you might have an AP that has a power of 100 milliwatts, but the power is going to vary depending on the context. Is this an indoor device? Is it an outdoor device? And it's also going to vary based on the country because there are some regulations even in the ISM frequencies, the industrial, scientific, and medical frequencies. Uh, and, and so we've got these two values, the watt and the decibel, uh, and they do relate to each other. We're going to see some references to different calculations a little bit later on, all right, in this particular lesson. All right, but again, uh, a decibel is a logarithmic unit of measurement that expresses the amount of power relative to whatever it's referencing. All right, uh, calculating the actual decibel values, that can be a little bit difficult sometimes. Uh, understanding the general concept or the context of a decibel is pretty simple. But there, there are uh, some the, these guiding factors, if you will, these four or five, uh, excuse me, five different values that you see here that kind of simplifies our task, if you will. Uh, when the power is 10 dB, again, the compared value is going to be 10 times more powerful than whatever the reference value is. And it works the other way. If it's uh, 10 times less powerful, that would be a minus 10 dB. 
3 dB uh, is, again, we're dealing with a logarithmic scale here, so it's not, uh, uh, not directly related, uh, at least linearly, to the 10 dB value. If the power is 3 dB, then it's twice as powerful. If it's minus 3 dB, it's half. All right. Now, the decibels themselves are used a lot in wireless networks to compare powers. All right. The electric power of a transmitter and the electromagnetic power of an antenna. So we're talking about passive and active amplification. All right. Let's scroll down to the next section here and talk about this in relation to a milliwatt. Transmitters are expressed in powers of milliwatts. So when I'm converting between decibels and milliwatts, I'm going to use the rules of 3 and 10. And this is a really, really important concept to understand, the rules of 3 and 10. So the first rule is if I'm going up plus 3 dB, remember that's two times the power, all right, we're going to go up 2 milliwatts. If I go minus 3 dB, that's divided by half the power, which is 0.5 milliwatts. Plus 10 dB is 10 times the power, 10 milliwatts. Minus 10 dB is a tenth of the power, which is 1 milliwatt. Okay? We're going to look at some examples and some calculations here in a minute, but this is a pretty important concept to understand. Now, if we go back to the theory, the, what we talked about previously, since the signal that a transmitter emits is an alternating current, all right, the power levels are expressed in milliwatts. Uh, basically, we're comparing powers between the transmitters uh, and comparing milliwatts, and we're using the dBm prefix, or, or suffix, I should say, the M suffix in, in reference to a milliwatt. Okay, now they didn't mention the reference here in this particular scale, but zero dBm sends the same amount of milliwatts as the reference source. So the power reference is one milliwatt. So at zero dBm, we're operating at one milliwatt. So we can see that zero crossing there in the middle of the diagram. Zero dBm represents one milliwatt. So 10 dBm would be 10 times that reference. Minus 10 dBm would be one-tenth of that reference. 3 dM, dBm is twice as powerful as that reference. And minus 3 dBm is half uh, as powerful as that reference. All right. So let's say, for example, I have a device that sends 6 dBm. Okay. Now, how do I calculate that? Uh, the, it is actually four times as powerful as the reference source because we're adding 3 d, dBm, which makes it twice as powerful, and then we're adding another 3 dBm, which makes it twice as powerful again, which is four times in total or four milliwatts in this particular case. Okay? Again, we'll, we'll go through some examples in a little bit. Uh, I'll put some in Notepad here. So the rules of 3 and 10 allow you to easily determine the transmit power that is based on either gain or loss in decibels. And we use the 3s and 10s rule uh, to be able to calculate that. All right. Now, there is actually a formula that you can use. Uh, the direct formula is the power in milliwatts. Uh, let me put this down. The power in milliwatts is equal to one milliwatt times 10 to the power of the power in dBm. Did I write that? The power, parentheses, there we go, in dBm divided by 10. All right. Now, you're not going to have to know that formula for the exam. But if you were to really do the calculations, not kind of rounding with the threes and tens rules, this is how you would calculate it. All right, that's the direct formula for converting decibels to milliwatts. Make sure I wrote that down correctly. 
The power in milliwatts is equal to the reference, which is one milliwatt, zero dB, times 10 to the power of the power in dBm divided by 10. Okay, good, all right? So let's go through a couple of examples here. Let's say I wanna convert 36 dBm to milliwatts, all right? Now, we express the dBm's as sums, if you will, of tens and threes. Now, it doesn't, the math does not always work out this way, all right? But in the case of Cisco, in the case of the Cisco exam, uh, most likely you're gonna be calculating these values based on these numbers that can be represented by our threes and tens. So 36 dBm is going to equal to 10 plus 10 plus 10, which is 30 plus 3 plus 3, uh, which is 36, all right? And again, we're referencing this in uh, our tens and threes, if you will. So we always start with the reference value uh, or the reference uh, dB, which is or dBm, which is 1 sorry, the reference dB, which is dB0, which is equal to one milliwatt, all right? And then we simply start to apply our rules of tens and threes, either multiplying or dividing by 10, or multiplying and dividing by twos as appropriate, right? Based on what we just calculated. So we have one milliwatt, we got times 10, times 10, times 10, times two, times two, because remember, three dB is two times the power, 10 dB is 10 times the power, all right? So if we multiply all that together, that is uh, 10, 100, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 milliwatts. So that equals 4,000 milliwatts, which is equal to four watts, all right? What about example number two? Let's say I want to convert 27 dBm to milliwatts. All right. So let's do the same thing. Again, tens and threes. So 27 dBm is equal to 10 plus 10 plus 10 in this case. Oops, I forgot my pluses. Plus 10 plus 10 minus three. So again, most of the numbers that we're calculating, you can get there by using the tens and threes rules. Uh, we're gonna start again with our reference, zero dB, which is one milliwatt. And then we're going to start to multiply our 10 times our 10 times our 10. Now in this case, we have to take all of those numbers and we have to divide that by two. We have to have the right order of operations here because minus three dB is two, which is gonna to equal to 500 milliwatts. All right? So again, using the tens and threes references, we can do our calculations uh, and calculate essentially decibels to milliwatts but what about the other direction? What if I want to go to from uh, uh, milliwatts to decibels? So let's say, for example, I have 40 milliwatts, and I want to convert that to decibels in reference to a milliwatt. So now we're using twos and tens, not tens, threes and tens, but twos and tens. Uh, so 40 milliwatts in this case is going to equal 10 times two times two. Now keep in mind what this rep, uh, represents. This represents the multiples, right? Tens and threes, we're talking about decibel increases or decibel decreases or overall decibel value. When we talk about tens and twos, we're talking about multiples, multiples of 10, multiples of two. So if I substitute plus 10 for the 10, and the plus threes for the twos, then I can get my dBm's. So 40 milliwatts, 
Well, we don't need to write that down again. So the 10 is plus 3, or plus 10, excuse me, uh, and because 10 times is equal to plus 10 dB, 2 times is equal to plus 3 dB, another 2 times is another 3 dB, which equals 16 total dBs in reference to the milliwatt. Oops, I forgot my equal sign there. Does that make sense? So when you're talking about tens and twos, you're talking about multiples, 10 times or two times. When you're talking about tens and threes, you're talking about decibels, increase and decrease, plus 10 dB, minus 10 dB, plus 3 dB, minus uh, 3 dB. All right. Uh, let's take a look at another example here. Uh, let's do, say, for example, 50 milliwatts to dBm. All right. So let's get rid of all this, and we're going to do 50 milliwatts to dBm. So again, we're going to use our twos and tens for our 50 milliwatts. All right. So 50 is going to equal 50 milliwatts is going to equal 10 times 10, all right? Uh, and then we're going to divide that by 2. Again, powers, right? 10 times 10 is 100, divided by 2 is 50. We're going to apply the rules of 10s and 3s. We're going to substitute the plus 10 for the 10s and the minus 3s for the 2s, which means that we have plus 10, plus 10, and then minus 3 for the 2s, which is going to equal to 17 dBm. Decibels in reference to a milliwatt. All right. So again, we're talking about numbers that are easy to calculate because they fall within those thresholds, if you will. Uh, that may not always be the case, um, but uh, for the most part, we can kind of approximate or we can get the exact number. There is a chart that's available here that does all the different conversions. Minus 20 dBm is equal to 0 0.01 milliwatts. Minus 19 dBm is equal to 0 0.0125 milliwatts and so on. But again, that reference on the right here, 0 dB, 1 milliwatt. So that would be a dBm. And if I go to 3 dB uh, or, you know, uh, any number in between, we get not exactly two times, but pretty close to two times, 1.9953. So we can round it up. These numbers are actually calculated based on the formula uh, that I had described previously. All right. So these are the kind of exact values, if you will. All right. So now let's talk about antennas, specifically antenna power. Uh, antennas themselves do not send electrical alternating current. They send out an electromagnetic field, a polarized electromagnetic field. So we have to compare the power of the antenna without using the indirect value of the current that was generated by the axis point. So we have to measure the power gain relative to some sort of reference antenna. And what you're seeing in this particular case, this diagram, if you will, represents something called an isotropic antenna. Now, this is a theoretical point source, if you will, of our electromagnetic radio wave, or electromagnetic wave, I should say, not radio wave. Basically, it means that the signal is going to radiate with the same intensity in all directions. There's no preferred direction of radiation. The radiation emits uh, 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 uniformly in all directions over a sphere, uh, sphere excuse me, centered on the source. Um, now, the isotropic antenna is actually used as a reference radiator, uh, which all other radiators are compared. All right. Uh, and that's, uh, this is how we uh, essentially determine the gain of a particular antenna based on this isotropic radiator of electromagnetic waves, which, by the way, is theoretically impossible, all right? But we can still use it as a reference. 
All right. The, the, the term actually uh, isotropic um, is it's not going to be related to like isotropic radiation. We don't talk about that. But when it comes to antenna theory, an isotropic antenna is, is really just a hypothetical antenna because you, you're imagining this point source of information of the radiated signal. Well, that point source doesn't just float in space. It has to be physically connected to a, a device that's going to generate the signal. And at that connection point, you're going to see no transmission or limited transmission. So this uh, isotropic antenna basically has the same intensity of radio waves in all direction. Uh, and uh, that's called directivity, by the way. Uh, and it has a directivity of zero dBi. Uh, dB in uh, a relative to isotropic in this particular case. All right. This is actually completely impossible. Uh, the radiation field itself uh, just wouldn't be uh, uh, possible. Okay. Now we are going to get into a discussion about antenna theory a little bit later on, but in electromagnetics, an antenna's power gain uh, or gain uh, is a performance indicator which combines the antenna's directivity and the electrical efficiency of that particular antenna. So in essence, the gain really just describes how well the antenna converts its input power into radio waves in a particular direction. In the receiving antenna, the gain describes how well the antenna converts those radio waves arriving from different directions into electrical power. All right. Now, if there is no direction specified, the gain value is understood as a reference to the peak value of the gain uh, and the gain in the direction of the antenna is what we call the main lobe. And we'll get into that a little bit later on as we get into the specifics of, of antenna theory, all right? Now, antenna gain overall is defined as a ratio of the power produced by the antenna on the antenna's beam axis to the power produced based on this isotropic antenna, all right? Which again is sending equally sensitive signals in all directions from that floating point reference. All right, this ratio is going to be expressed in decibels. Again, we'll get into this in detail uh, when we get into antenna theory, but I'm just trying to describe a DBI in relation to a isotropic antenna. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about decibels isotropic, right? Now, an alternative de definition, which we'll see a little bit later, is the received power to the power received by a lossless half-wave dipole antenna. Uh, dipole uh, we'll talk about later on, but that means that we're going to be uh, writing that reference in terms of dBd, decibels in terms of a dipole antenna. Uh, now, lossless dipole antennas generally have a gain of about 2.15 dBi. That's the relationship between the dBd antenna and the DBI antenna. So if I, I'll show you this formula a little bit later on, but the gain in DBD is always going to be 2.15 greater than the gain in DBI. All right, and we'll take uh, we'll take a look at that. I keep saying this, but we'll take a look at that a little bit later when we get into our antenna theory. So again, the this whole concept of a, a one dot antenna. Uh, it's, it's practically impossible because you need something to link to the antenna and something that's going to send current to that antenna. It doesn't usually radiate out equally in all directions because the construction causes it to send signal in more in one direction than it might in another. All right. So even though this theoretical antenna doesn't exist, it's used as a reference to compare actual antennas. Uh, and the scale we'll talk about uh, in, in more detail later on is called the DBI scale. 
Now, the logarithmic progression of the DBI scale uses the same tens and threes rules that we saw before, all right? So three DBI is twice as powerful, 10 DBI is 10 times as powerful, and so on. Uh, again, using the same logarithm uh, progression, uh, we can start to now compare antennas like, like we do comparing transmitters. So a six DBI and another nine DBI the, the second antenna, uh, the first being the 6 dBi and the second being the 9 dBi, the second antenna is 3 dBi more powerful than the first uh, or two times uh, as powerful. All right. There are other scales that we can use to compare antennas. Uh, and again, well, I mentioned it uh, in reference to the dipole as well. We'll talk about that when we get into our antenna theory section. Okay. As far as the system itself, there is a value called the effective isotropic radiated power. Uh, this takes into account all aspects of the system. All right. Now, remember the antenna is a passive amplification device. So it actually doesn't add any energy to the signal that it receives over the cable. The only thing that the antenna can do is focus that energy into a specific direction, either with a wide beam width or with a narrow beam width, and we talked about that concept earlier. Okay, So the access point is generating a signal uh, at uh, a certain level, a certain power level in dB, uh, typically referenced in dB in, dB in reference to a milliwatt. There is a connector on the cable to that access point. There is a cable itself which has a specific length, specific physical properties that result in some, some sort of loss or some sort of attenuation. Uh, and we may even have put active filters in that line as well, or even active amplifiers possibly. Uh, and then we have the connection to the antenna itself. So the effective isotropic radio power measures how much actual energy is being sent from the antenna towards the main beam. We're not talking about uh, active energy behind the antenna because of bleed off or, or inefficiencies in the antenna design. We're talking about the main signal path, if you will. So we are transmitting at 10 dBm. We have a 6 dBi antenna we have a cable loss of 3 dB. So the effective isotropic radiated power is 13 dBm. 10 dB to start with, uh, plus 6 dBi, minus 3 dB loss, 13 dBm. You'll notice how we're not converting necessarily values. There is no direct conversion between dBi and dBm. There is a conversion between dBd and dBi uh, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. We'll talk about it again, but there is no direct conversion between dBm and dBi because it's just uh, the antenna's gain in reference to the isotropic antenna. All right, and we, we talked a little bit about this concept of the dots in the stream, if you will. Uh, they, they mentioned this in, in, as another example, like a balloon. The quantity of air inside the balloon is the quantity of energy that we're going to be radiating. If the balloon is shaped as a sphere with an imaginary AP at the center of that sphere, that energy is equally distributed in all directions. The AP at the center of the balloon is kind of radiating energy in all different directions, much like our uh, uh, fake isotropic antenna. Now, let's say that the balloon is pressed into the shape of a sausage, right? And the AP is placed on one end of the sausage. That would be equivalent to, say, like a patch antenna that might go at the end of a wall. The quantity of the air in the balloon is still the same, but now the energy, energy radiates in, in, uh, uh, along the sausage, if you will. All right, so think of that as like a focused beam width in an antenna or a directional antenna as opposed to an omnidirectional antenna. When an antenna concentrates the energy that it gets from the cable in a particular direction, it is said that that antenna is more powerful even though it's not actually increasing the amplitude of the signal in that particular direction. 
and the antenna radiates the energy in that direction, which is uh, uh, a lot better on the receiving side as, uh, as opposed to maybe uh, a, an antenna that radiates signals in all directions. All right? So describing the power of an antenna is like comparing their ability, if you will, to concentrate the flow of energy in one particular direction. So the higher its dBi or dBd value, both of those values can be used to reference an antenna, the more it focuses or concentrates the energy that it receives into a narrow beam width. The total amount of power that is radiated is not actually higher. We're not amplifying the actual transmitted signal. These are not active amplifiers. They are passive amplifiers. All right, but the total amount of power that is radiated in a particular direction, uh, well, it stays the same, but it's focused energy, if you will. All right. So wherever that beam is concentrated, if the received energy is higher because the receiver gets a higher percentage of that energy that's being transmitted, then that results in higher gain. All right. So as a, as a telecom engineer or as a network engineer, you need to have a way to determine how much energy is actually going to be radiated from the antenna to the main beam, and that's where EIRP comes into play. Okay. Now keep in mind that EIRP is an isotropic calculation because it is the amount of power that an isotropic antenna, remember this is measured in dBi, as you can see on the diagram, the amount of power that an isotropic antenna would need to emit to pr produce this peak power density in that particular direction. All right. So EIRP basically expresses in its isotropic equivalent value how much energy is going to be radiated in a particular beam. What's going to affect that? Well, obviously the transmit power of the access point, the loss of the cable, but also the beam shape and the beam strength is going to be important. The first two relate to the beam strength. The type of antenna that I use is going to relate to the beam shape. All right. So in mathematical terms, we do express EIRP EI, uh, in terms of dBm which is the transmit power plus the gain of the antenna. But again, that signal has to go through some sort of connector, whether the antenna is physically connected to the AP or built into the motherboard or whatever it might be, or there's a cable, so there's going to be some sort of loss. All right. Now, when we do talk about the regulatory domains uh, in Europe, ETSI, and in, in North America, um, uh, FCC, we talk about the regulatory domains, we talk about those regulatory domains in relation to how they limit the maximum amount of transmit power uh, or an EIRP value, which is the power that's the resulted, uh, result of the system itself, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that, those regulations in a little bit. You have to pick as an engineer the right type of antenna, the right type of transmit power, based on the regulations of the country, uh, even in the industrial, scientific, and medical bands, because that is one thing that's highly regulated in that space. All right. All right, let's take a look at some of the questions at the end of this section here. How much power does 3dB provide? Well, tens and threes rules, right? 10 times, three, uh, two times. So 3dB of uh, power provides twice as much power, right? Not three times, five times, or 10 times, but twice as much power. How powerful is a device that sends at three dBm? Well, as I just stated, if that is twice as much power and our reference is one milliwatt, that means we're transmitting at two milliwatts. All right. All right. Uh, let's see, matchy, matchy, uh, match the dB with the transmit power. So let's see, power divided by 2 would be minus 3 dB. Uh, power divided by 10 would be minus 10 dB. Power 10 times would be plus 10 dB. 
and the power of 2 times would be plus 3 dB. Okay? All right. Uh, which unit of measure is used to compare antennas on a dipole? All right. Well, it's decibels in reference to the dipole antenna, which is decibels in reference to D. D stands for dipole. That's the suffix. So it's going to be DBD. DBI would be an isotropic antenna. Which of the following is the formula to calculate EIRP? So we've got the transmit power in dBm's, uh, in milliwatts, excuse me, right? The transmit power is always going to be referenced uh, in dBm's, excuse me, decibels in reference to a milliwatt, plus the antenna gain, which is referenced uh, dB in reference to an isotropic antenna, minus the cable loss, which is going to be referenced as a negative dB value. So that would be this answer right here. Okay, Decibels in reference to a milliwatt. Antenna gain uh, in reference to isotropic antenna. And then the cable loss in reference to dBs. All right. So we'll wrap up this lesson. We are now going to get into our next discussion, which is describing antenna characteristics. So in our next uh, topic here, we're going to talk about different antennas and different antenna characteristics. Uh, an antenna is obviously what we need to take that signal from the wireless access point and transmit that signal over our airspace to reach the destination. And the type of antenna that we decide to use will depend on how the antenna is going to be placed, where we want the signal to be received, and so on. The two main families of antennas that we see here are omnidirectional antennas and directional antennas. Omnidirectional, of course, meaning that the signal is going to be transmitted in all directions, and a directional antenna is an antenna that focuses a signal into a particular direction. Right? So a directional antenna takes that radiated signal, takes the same amount of energy uh, inbound as an omnidirectional antenna, but the difference is how we focus the beam into a specific direction. Uh, directional antennas, because they are focusing that, uh, that uh, radiated signal in a particular direction, uh, that means that they have higher gain, typically. Uh, they add more gain, if you will, uh, and they're more powerful, uh, again, passively more powerful than an omnidirectional antenna. The rating of a directional antenna in uh, DBIs or even in DBDs will, is going to be higher than, say, an omnidirectional antenna. Another way of representing the change in the radiation pattern is to talk about the angles, right? An omnidirectional antenna radiates all around itself in 360 degrees, what we refer to as maybe the beam width, if you will. A directional antenna radiates towards a certain direction, but the beam might be wide or narrow, and that angle is, uh, is how we measure that. Is the angle wider or is the angle uh, um, you know, less narrow? The angle for each antenna type is fixed, and that's what we define as the radiation pattern. Now, these are not two-dimensional patterns. These are three-dimensional patterns. They're depicted in the diagram here as two-dimensional patterns, but we have to consider them from a three-dimensional standpoint. All right, now that angle, based on the antenna type, we call that the beam width. That's going to correlate directly to the strength of the signal in the main beam, right? The narrower the beam, the higher the strength of the signal in the beam, and the higher the gain. Some antennas are considered to be high gain because they concentrate that beam, allowing us to basically send the signal very large distances. Think of a flashlight, for example, focusing the flashlight beam uh, in, a, in an adjustable flashlight. Okay, So Wi-Fi antennas radiate their energy, uh, their magnetic fields, through the air, but uh, you know they could work in space or the vacuum of space, the fields, which are electric or magnetic, 
don't really depend on the material that they're passing through. Uh, some material could have an effect on the uh, signal speed slightly, but mostly the effect is going to be based on the amplitude or the, the strength of that signal. All right. Uh, electromagnetic signals, as we talked about in our very first section of explaining our principles here, uh, travel pretty much at the speed of light, which is about uh, 300,000 kilometers per second or so. All right, so let's talk a little about some different antenna types. The first thing we have is our omnidirectional antenna, and we're seeing the different planes of the radiated pattern, what we call the azimuth plane and the elevation plane. So let's talk about that first. Keep in mind that we're trying to represent the beam form or how the beam is created or the radiated pattern is created based on a three-dimensional view, right? So we need to look at this because we're representing this on a piece of paper, which is two-dimensional, we have to look at two planes of existence, all right? Uh, antennas are always going to radiate in some sort of three-dimensional environment. Uh, but it's really not that, I wouldn't say impossible, but it's not that practical to represent those 3D uh, radiation patterns on a piece of paper. All right. So vendors, whenever they create these charts that represent the propagation pattern of an antenna, they provide two views. One's called the horizontal plane or the H-plane, or the azimuth chart, and the other is called the elevation plane, or the E-plane. The azimuth chart represents the radiation pattern as if you're looking down on top of the antenna. So think of the dipole antenna, you're looking down to the point top of that antenna, and that shows the signal how it spreads out ahead, behind, to the right, to the left, but not how the signal spreads up and down. All right, so this is your top-down view, if you will. The E-plane, or elevation, E-plane is up and down, right, or elevation is up and down, represents the radiation pattern as, it, as you're looking at the side of the antenna, right? So it shows how the signal spreads ahead and behind to the top and to the bottom, but not how it spreads out to the right or the left. So basically, this is your side view. You put those two together, and you can kind of extrapolate, if you will, the 3D representation of the antenna itself. All right. Omnidirectional antennas are omnidirectional at least in one plane. And that's usually that horizontal plane or the azimuth plane. Uh, they radiate around themselves. We, we can't quite get that vertically or in the elevation plane because we do have the connector and so on all right so the shape of the radiation pattern looks kind of like a donut if you will in a pure sphere the shape is common for uh, or the antenna type or the antenna selection is what we would see on a lot of small office or home office or just regular access points all right now we will talk about dual band and and single band antennas we'll talk about uh, the concept of, of 5 gigahertz versus 2.4 gigahertz. But most basic omnidirectional antennas are going to be dual band dipoles. Um, and the antenna is really not very powerful. It's just a, an indoor AP to provide some basic connectivity uh, in a small geographical area. All right. Uh, it uh, radiates everywhere on the H plane to reach the clients in the whole room. Uh, there is some vertical aspect, but it's, it's designed to pretty much work in a single floor, uh, you know, um, not necessarily vertically, but horizontally. All right. We can see a, a representation here uh, from the axis points perspective. So the azimuth plane on a 2.4 gigahertz radio all the way around the axis point. But if you look at it from the E-plane uh, view, you can see the lobe is not quite 360 degrees. And 5 gigahertz is going to have a very similar pattern uh, as well. All right. That's a, an access point with an integrated antenna. This is pretty important to understand because when you mount these antennas or when you mount these access points, 
uh, you can't just arbitrarily mount them, right? For example, mounting them on the ceiling, uh, you know, parallel to the ceiling would be perfect uh, because it presents uh, the best coverage. But if you mount them on a, on a wall uh, where they're perpendicular to the ceiling, uh, then all of a sudden you can get great coverage sitting next to the, the access point. But as you move away from the access point, the coverage uh, degrades quite significantly. All right. And, and frankly, for most office environments, you're going to get uh, an antenna that has, uh, or an access point, excuse me, that has integrated antennas. Um, and they typically have about a gain of about 4 dBi, depending on the access point itself. A more uh, specialized deployment would be, for example, like a ceiling mount antenna. You can see, again, it's very similar to an omnidirectional antenna that's integrated into the access point. Uh, this is just a higher gain, uh, so you're covering a large H-plane area. Um, the 2 or 4 dBi antenna in an integrated access point might not be enough. So you could use this high gain omnidirectional antenna that's going to give you, you know, 5.2 dBi gain uh, or more, depending on the type of antenna. In this particular case, we're seeing a 5.2 dBi antenna. Uh, the gain is actually achieved in this case by reducing the E-plane angle, making it flatter based on the antenna design, because the antenna is uh, typically supposed to be clipped to uh, a T-bar on a drop ceiling or something to that effect to give uh, great coverage all around the antenna, but not necessarily above it and not necessarily directly below it. Again, not in the center of the donut, if you will. All right, so this antenna with a 5.2 dBi gain has a much higher gain than your typical 2.4, 2.14 dBi dipole antenna, meaning that it's twice as powerful, okay? Uh, but the gain is, again, passive because the antenna itself is still not providing any kind of active amplification. All right. Uh, there are some other antennas as well. Uh, let's see here. We've got, a, in this case, a high-gain mast mount antenna. Um, and and uh, so this would be installed on a mast, uh, typically covering a large area. Uh, again, the, the, we don't talk about the distances necessarily here in this particular case uh, because the, uh, that's all going to be based on, well, it's going to be based on several factors, right? What is the DBM of the access point? What is the do, DB loss of the connectors and the cabling and so on? Uh, and then also just what is the loss in the open space, you know, with obstacles and, and free path loss and so on? All right, so you're looking at the patterns here. They look very similar to each other, uh, but again, the, the, the H plane is, is pretty similar. The E plane is slightly uh, uh, different, all right? So if you want to cover maybe a big meeting space, uh, an open air meeting space, uh, the, the, the coverage again up and down, if you look at the E plane chart, for the 12 dBi antenna is going to be less than the coverage up and down on the E-plane for the 5.2 dBi antenna. So standing in the center of the donut, you're not going to get any great connectivity, but you're going to get a much further range. Uh, it's almost four times as powerful, actually, in this case. All right, we might actually select other antennas based on the different types of coverage scenarios that we need as well. A wall-mounted patch antenna, for example. This is a directional antenna that's designed to cover uh, um, the airspace in a specific direction. Maybe it's at the end of a, uh, a warehouse uh, row of storage crates or storage uh, shelves or whatever. Maybe it's in a, at the end of a long hallway or uh, maybe a, 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 a um, rectangular conference room or something like that. Uh, you're going to get more gain than your omnidirectional antenna because we're focusing the uh, signal into a specific direction, right? The shape of the coverage pattern depends on, again, the type of antenna, but you can see the, 
azimuth plane for a 2.4 gigahertz radio, 4 dBi gain antenna, uh, and then we see the azimuth plane for our 5 gigahertz, 3, 3 dBi antenna. All right, uh, so again, this is going to be ideal for an indoor environment. It's flat. The appearance of the antenna is relatively discreet, so it's not some big dish or some pole sticking out of the ceiling. Uh, and uh, you're going to get a little bit of coverage on the lobes behind the antenna, but most of the coverage is going to be in front of the antenna. Uh, you know, depending on where the antenna is positioned will help out. Okay. Uh, we also have some very high gain wall mounted antennas. An example of that would be a wall mount Yagi antenna. Uh, this is another directional type of antenna. Uh, Yagi Ude. Uh, because it was invented by H. Yagi and S. Ude in Japan, uh, as it says there in the book. But you can see the H-plane and E-plane representations here as well. All right, so imagine spinning those around on an on a, on a, uh, axis, and you can create that 3D pattern. All right, thin vertical and horizontal planes, but a very narrow beam slight radiation in the back because of the how the antenna is actually manufactured uh, but uh, that's called the butterfly effect I guess because it looks kind of like a butterfly uh, those side lobes get created and the back lobes get created but the main field in the, is going to be in the front of the antenna 13.5 dBi very well suited for long corridors large warehouses uh, now, when you're installing this type of antenna, you'll see there's a dot on the antenna itself. That's because this particular antenna has polarity. Um, so when we have a patch, uh, it's rectangular. So uh, it's kind of obvious to identify the polarity of the antenna in that particular case. Uh, with the Yagi, the base of uh, the antenna is square, although it's not really kind of square in this case, it's more rectangular. Uh, but it's a post, right? So you need to take a look at uh, uh, how to, how to uh, mount the antenna based on uh, how we want the sine wave or the signal to be generated. All right, the black dot in this particular case indicates uh, that this should be the side that's used as the top of the antenna. All right. All right. Another type of antenna is a parabolic dish. This is a super high gain antenna, typically a very narrow beam width, as you can see, some side lobes as well, 21 dBi gain, uh, almost as 100 times, almost 100 times more powerful than a traditional dipole antenna. All right, so you see the butterfly effect, uh, again, based on how the antenna is actually physically constructed uh, and so on. All right. So let's go through the review questions here. Actually, before we do that, I wanted to bring up uh, a document uh, because I think this is important. Uh, obviously, when it comes to technology, technology changes, uh, you know, significantly. So my recommendation would always be to reference the latest documentation. If I go to Cisco.com and I search on antennas, I should be able to find the document. There is a document that talks about antennas and accessories. This is from 2020. Uh, and this will kind of go through all of the current models of antennas that are available. Uh, it, it does kind of describe the connections and connectors and so on, which are F-type uh, connectors, um, or excuse me, RPT and C-type connectors, excuse me, uh, not F-type. Uh, talking about lightning arresters and so on and then we should see a representation of the antennas themselves here's all the different antenna models and we should see in this document as well i'm scrolling down the yeah the specifics on each antenna so these are the dipoles the other thing you'll notice is this gold band the gold band indicates that this is a dual frequency antenna, meaning that it operates in both the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz range. All right, this is the gain in 2.4. This is the gain in 5 gigahertz. Linear polarization, omnidirectional. Uh, 
in the azimuth plane, only 40 degrees in the elevation plane, uh, and it's directly connected to the access point using the RPTNC connector. Uh, this is a dual band short dipole antenna. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these because there's quite a few, but you can see the, uh, the different ratings uh, and so on. Here's a dual band ceiling mount omnidirectional antenna with four elements. Uh, we use that for um, basically signal uh, quality and signal clarity. Um, that's the reason why we have multiple antennas. We'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. Uh, and then the gain here and so on. So this is a great document to reference. Uh, antennas are constantly changing. The construction of these antennas are constantly changing. So always reference the latest documentation on, on Cisco. Um, to see that information, all right? Now, one of the things that we did not talk about uh, is uh, spatial awareness, right? What happens in my environment when I transmit my electromagnetic signal, my, rate, my, my signal from my antenna? Um, and we uh, didn't talk about the concepts of multipath distortion, absorption, reflection, refraction, etc. Um, but hopefully at a later time, we'll be able to get into some of those topics a little bit later on. All right. Which type of antenna adds the most gain? All right. The least gain is going to be omnidirectional, of course. Uh, the most gain is going to be a directional uh, Yagi antenna. Again, going back to our well, our parabolic dish is 21 dB, um, and our Yagi antenna is 13 dB, and our wall mount patch is about, um, well, it depends on the, on the antenna type, but uh, maybe 4 dBi, 3 to 4 dBi in this particular case, and then your omnidirectionals. So based on the choices that we have here, the Yagi is going to provide us the most gain. Which statement correctly describes the coverage area of an omnidirectional antenna? The azimuth plane, or the horizontal plane, is going to be a larger coverage than the elevation plane. All right. If it was 360 degrees in all directions, that would be our isotropic antenna, which is not what we're talking about in this case. Which three antennas are examples of a directional antenna? Well, Yagi would be directional, parabolic dish, and a patch antenna. Dipole is almost, uh, well, really the same thing as an omnidirectional antenna. All right, with a transmit power of 100 milliwatts and a cable loss of minus 4 dB, which antenna should be used to keep the EIRP under 100 milliwatts? So the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate the dBm. We cannot do the EIRP calculation. Remember, EIRP is equal to dBm minus the dB loss plus the dBi gain of the antenna. All right. Now this needs to be less than or equal to 100 milliwatts. So we're going to have to do a conversion back as well. So first thing we need to do is we need to convert the milliwatts to dBm. Now we're going to use our tens and threes in this case. Uh, 10 times 10 is equal to 100. Uh, and there's a direct conversion, of course, to 10 plus 10. 10 plus 10, which is our dB, which equals 20 dBm. All right. So we have an EIRP of 20 dBm minus, what was our loss? Our loss was 4 dB, 4 dB, plus whatever the gain is of our antenna, dBi, has got to be less than or equal to 100 milliwatts. All right. So again, now we're talking about uh, 
20 dB, right? Uh, 20 dBm. So less than or equal to 20 dBm in this case. So we lost four. We had 20 to start with. We lost four. So that means that anything less than or four or less in dBi would give us the appropriate value. So this has to be anywhere from, we'll just call it one to four in this particular case. So the only one that fits this is the three dBi antenna. Six dBi would mean that we would exceed our 100 milliwatts um, by, by three dBm actually, all right? So that's the answer to that one. All right, so we got two sections left in this, uh, this overall lesson. We're gonna take a look at IEEE wireless standards. Uh, and in the IEEE wireless standards, we're gonna talk about some of those things that I kind of briefly mentioned in this section, which does have to do with, uh, in some instances, how the access point and the antennas are used, uh, as well as, uh, so multi, um, uh, ratio combining or maximum uh, maximal radio ratio combining beam forming spatial multiplexing those types of things we'll talk about and then we're going to talk about uh, wireless component roles uh, which has uh, you know really what is the client and how does it associate uh, what are the what is the SSID what are split MAC functions and so on so let's continue on Moving on to our next section, describing IEEE wireless standards. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, several different factors actually here. We're gonna talk about the different channels that are used by the different standards, the different data rates, uh, different transmission techniques uh, in wireless communication. This is a pretty extensive discussion, so we're not gonna have time to really go into a vast amount of detail. We could spend several hours actually talking about this particular topic but we do want to hit some of the highlights and talk about some of the standards that we see uh, in wireless today. So we see some of the uh, standards listed, listed here in the, in the table. All right. So one of the things that we consider is the band, the range of the uh, particular standard, the frequencies, uh, but understanding how we can use these in combination or really define how, uh, you know, what, which particular standard I might choose and, and the kind of connectivity that I want to have in my environment. Uh, so what modulation technique I use, how the frames are coded, uh, what type of headers uh, I'm supposed to include in the frame, what is the physical transmission mechanism that I'm using for a particular frame. Uh, all of these are defined by uh, the access points and or defined by the standards, I should say, uh, and then uh, facilitated by the access points and the other components in the wireless environment so that we can communicate effectively, okay? So let's start by talking about 802.11 in general. First of all, 802 is the IEEE working group uh, for um, network communication, if you will, uh, network technologies and so on, formed in February of 1980. Uh, it is part of the 802.set of LAN protocols, uh, and it, uh, 802.11, I should say, is a, is a set of the LAN protocols, or local area network LAN protocols, and it specifies the media access control and the physical layer protocols implemented in wireless LAN networks. Uh, frequencies included in this are 2.4 gigahertz range, the 5 gigahertz range, the 6 gigahertz range, and even the 60 gigahertz range, which we don't actually see listed here. All right. The, probably the, the most uh, altered or changed area of networking over a short period of time than you would see with any other networking technology. All right, which is why even this documentation is not completely up to date. So I'm going to try and introduce some of the other concepts here. All right, there are many, many different devices, obviously, that use wireless. That's the whole point of having wireless. Uh, and the standards committee, uh, 802, uh, which is the IEEE, our Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, 
Land Man Standards Committee formed this group, uh, which was released in 1997, uh, to, to really kind of provide standards and amendments based on wireless networking products using the Wi-Fi uh, brand, all right? Now, overall, 802. Uh, the, the entire 802.11 family has a whole bunch of different half duplex, on the radio side anyway, half duplex over the air modulation techniques that use the same basic protocol. All right, there's a carrier sense multiple access with collision, collision avoidance, CSMACA, uh, where the equipment listens to the channel. Uh, for the users uh, before transmitting each packet. Now, in uh, 1997, 802.11.1997 was really the first wireless networking standard in the family, but 802.11b was really the first widely accepted standard. Then we had 802.11a, we had 802.11g, we had 802.11n, and then 802.11ac. There are other standards in the family, uh, C through F and H and J, uh, but they're used to extend the current scope of some of the existing standards, uh, which may also include corrections to maybe a previous uh, uh, specification. So we're going to break down some of these. These are some of the most common ones that you see here, 802.11 AB in 1999, G in 2003, uh, 802.11 A, uh, 5 gigahertz, uh, and so on. We see some of the, the um, uh, 802.11n in 2009, AC in 2013, and 802.11ax, uh, uh, June of 2020, uh, but it's uh, not hasn't uh, yet been ratified. But we'll talk about some more standards as well. Uh, both B and G, in fact, all of these standards, uh, pretty much use what we call the ISM bands or industrial, scientific, and medical bands that are regulated by FCC under the United States uh, uh, Code for Part 15. Um, and 802.11 actually, 802.11n actually uses that same band. Um, the reason this is critical is that even though this, this, these frequencies are regulated, they're not licensed. So your choice of frequency and band uh, will uh, be based on whether or not you have interferers within the frequency, both Wi-Fi interferers and non-Wi-Fi interferers like microwave ovens or cordless telephones, Bluetooth devices, and so on. All right. Now, we talk about two major frequency bands, as you can see here, uh, 2.4 gigahertz range uh, and the 5 gigahertz range. Uh, we also talk about different transmission techniques or encoding techniques uh, with uh, direct sequence spread spectrum and orthogonal uh, frequency division multiplexing, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, and then we see uh, the different data rates that are supported, 11 megabits per second, 54 megabits per second, up to 600 megabits per second, uh, 1.3 gig or 6.9 gig in wave 2, 4.8 gig for 802.11ax and so on. So let's start by, uh, even though the book doesn't really get into this in a lot of detail, let's start by talking about the different uh, um, signaling methods that are used in wireless. Uh, direct sequence spread spectrum, uh, as the name implies, is a, spe uh, a spread spectrum modulation technique. Uh, and the idea is that we are trying to transmit over a range of frequencies on a particular channel with the goal of reducing overall signal interference. The direct sequence modulation takes the transmitted signal using a wider bandwidth uh, than the actual information band or the one that's actually carrying the information. After the despreading or removal of the direct sequence modulation in the receiver, the information band is actually stored uh, while the unintentional and intentional interference gets reduced, all right? So uh, the DSSS algorithm takes the message bits, they get modulated by this pseudo-random bit sequence known as the spreading sequence. Uh, each spreading sequence bit 
which is called the chip, has a short duration, or I guess in relation, a larger bandwidth than the original message bits. The idea is that if we, we uh, have some interference with some of those bits, we still maintain enough of the bit pattern to be able to recognize the data, all right? Now, the modulation of the message bits scrambles and then spreads the pieces of data results in this, which results in this kind of bandwidth size that's nearly identical to that of the spreading sequence itself. The smaller chip duration, the larger the bandwidth of that resulting DSS signal. All right, so practically speaking, the idea is that we're trying to create a message that can be encoded and decoded even if we do uh, experience um, uh, interference in the, in the spectrum, if you will. All right, now orthogonal frequency division multiplexing works in uh, a similar fashion. Uh, it uses a method of encoding the digital data on different carrier frequencies, all right? So this is used uh, primarily in wideband communication. Uh, we see it a lot in like digital TV, uh, DSL internet access, of course, wireless networks as well. Uh, now, OFDM itself is not a spread spectrum technology. It is a frequency division multiplexing scheme um, that actually was been around for, for quite some time. I think it was in the mid-60s that it was actually generated or, or created, I should say, or introduced. All right. So in OFDM, we have these closely kind of spaced orthogonal subcarrier signals, and then they have overlapping spectra that are transmitted to carry data in parallel. All right, so rather than spreading the signal over a wide band of frequency, we're carrying the signal over these subcarriers. Uh, now, I, I, I'm pretty sure that later on we're going to see a representation of what these algorithms look like on paper, at least. Um, but but uh, it, is, it is a completely different kind of modulation scheme, if you will. Right, each subcarrier or the, the, the subcarriers or the signal is going to be modulated with, uh, you know, either quadrature amplitude modulation or phase shift keying. Uh, and we use a very low symbol rate in this case, which means that we can essentially carry more data in, in less amount of time, right, which then directly results in additional bandwidth or more bandwidth. All right. Now, the main advantage of using OFDM over, say, a single carrier scheme is that it uh, can really handle severe channel conditions like attenuation of high frequencies, uh, narrow band interference, uh, multipath distortion, and so on. All right. Uh, now, we don't need to get into the specifics of uh, intersymbol interference or ghosting and so on. Uh, it doesn't really apply to what we're talking about in this particular case, uh, but it, it is a, a different way of, of modulating the signal. Uh, orthogonal frequency division multiple access, or OFDMA, that's really just a multi-user version of OFDM. Uh, multiple access is actually uh, created in this case by assigning um, subsets of subcarriers to particular users, uh, which allows then multiple or simultaneous data rate transmissions from several users at the same time. Again, that's going to result generally in uh, a, a more a faster bandwidth, uh, uh, and that's really really critical. Obviously, when we're trying to to send information. All right, you'll also notice that. The uh, speed, obviously, 4.8 gigahertz at, in Wave 1, Wi-Fi 6, uh, uses either four spatial streams at 160 megahertz per channel or eight spatial tree streams with 80 megahertz per channel because we're combining or, or decoupling some of those, those carriers. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the standards uh, 
maybe there's a little bit of history that I want to mention as well prior to getting into that point. Um, but uh, 802.11a, uh, which is kind of in that first column, if you will, that's the 5 gigahertz UNII band, uh, uh, which provides 23 non-overlapping 20 megahertz wide channels rather than the standard 2.4 gigahertz ISM frequency band, which really only offers uh, three in the United States anyway, three non-overlapping 20 megahertz wide channels uh, where the other channels overlap. Hopefully we'll see a, a, doc, a, a visual representation of that a little bit later on. All right. So uh, depending on the country will depend on how the bands are created how the channels are created and how they're utilized. All right. Uh, another component that they don't really mention here in this lesson is the concept of the Wi-Fi Alliance. Uh, the the Wi-Fi Alliance is a uh, conglomerate of organizations that come together to describe uh, wireless technologies to make sure that there's interoperability between vendors between physical hardware and so on, but they also generated this kind of consumer-friendly numbering scheme, if you will, right? Uh, the Wi-Fi generations are one through six, uh, and they uh, we see Wi-Fi six represented here, refer to the 802.11b, the A, the G, the N, the AC, and the 802.11ax. So if you count that, that's six generations, if you will, of Wi-Fi, B, A, G, N, A, C, and A, X. Uh, the 802.11 technology uh, was, was started in the mid-80s, right, 1985, uh, and uh, we progressed ever since, right, um, you know, coming up with these different standards. So let's talk about what some of those standards look like. Um, in June of 1997, we had uh, 802.11-1997. That was a direct sequence spread spectrum physical layer as well as a frequency hopping spread spectrum physical layer. Operated in the 2.4 gigahertz range, uh, had a bandwidth of 22 megahertz uh, and a data rate of about one megabits per second or two megabits per second. Uh, didn't support uh, multiple input, multiple output, uh, and the range was about 20 meters inside uh, and up to 100 meters outside. Okay, that's where we started. And then in September of 1999, they came up with 802.11b, which used HR-DSSS. Uh, again, the 2.4 gigahertz range, 22 megahertz wide bandwidth, but we had data rates now of one meg, two megs, five and a half megs, or 11 megs. Uh, and the modulation technique was DSSS. A little bit better performance on the distance, about 30, 35 meters or so inside, about 140 meters outside. And then we started to see some different specification uh, uh, that came out uh, in the 19, well, we're on 1999, actually September of 1999, 802.11a came out, uh, but this was the OFDM physical layer, right? Uh, and this is, all of this sits within the one to six gigahertz range. OFDM or orthogonal frequency division multiplexing was the modulation technique. Uh, the standard was 802.11. It had data rates of six megs, nine, 12, 18 megabits per second, 24, uh, 36, 48, and 54 megabits per second. Uh, and it had a bandwidth of, of 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, or 20 megahertz. There were some different standards that kind of fell in this category. All right, distance limitation for this is about 35 meters indoors and about 120 meters outdoors, but more highly susceptible to attenuation because of the higher frequency, the 5 gigahertz frequency. We did see some other specifications around uh, that were based on this OFDM standard, 802.11j, which came out in 2004. Uh, 802.11p uh, came out, uh, I think, a little bit after that, maybe six years after that. And then 802.11y, which actually came out before 
802.11p. We don't really talk about those too much. Uh, we don't really see them too often. All right. We had uh, 802.11g, which came out in June of 2003. Uh, again, OFDM in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. But because it did use OFDM, it had the same data rates as 802.11a. A uh, little bit better on distance because it is a, uh, a 2.4 gigahertz frequency as opposed to 5 gigahertz, about 38 meters indoors, about 140 meters outdoors compared to with 35 and the 120 that we saw with A. Then in uh, 2009, late 2009, we had uh, 802.11n, uh, and that uh, operated in both the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz ranges, um, and uh, had bandwidths of about 20 megahertz uh, and 40 megahertz. So up to 288 megabits per second on the data rate for the 20 megahertz channels, and up to 600 megabits per second for the 40 megahertz channels. Uh, and this was also the first time that we had an introduction of MIMO technology, which we will talk about a little bit later on, uh, multiple input and multiple output. Uh, the distance uh, limitation here, uh, about double what we saw with 802.11a, about 70 meters uh, or 250 meters uh, outdoors. All right, uh, and then we had uh, 802.11ac, which came out in 2013. Uh, that's also OFDM, although it's a variant, a VHT variant of OFDM. With uh, 802.11n, we were using HT OFDM, uh, but uh, we don't need to talk about the specifics there. Uh, December of 2013, in the 5 gigahertz range, and it had different channel bandwidths, actually. We had a 20 megahertz version, a 40 megahertz version, an 80 megahertz version, and a 160 megahertz version, each one of them offering their own bandwidths. The 20 megahertz version offered up to 347 or so megabits per second, uh, 40 megahertz up to 800 megabits per second, 80 megahertz up to 1.7 gig, and 160 megahertz up to just about 3.5 gigs of throughput. Uh, eight possible streams using MIMO and up to 35 meters in distance. Uh, and then finally in September of last year, 2019, uh, this operates 802.11ax, or excuse me, 802.11ax, uh, which is H-E-O-F-D-M. Uh, has uh, operated in three different frequencies, uh, the 2.4 gigahertz range, the 5 gigahertz range, and then finally the 6 gigahertz range, uh, up to four bandwidths available, 20 megahertz, uh, um, 40 megahertz, 80 megahertz, and then what we call 80 plus 80, uh, which gave us up to 1.2 gigs or so at 20 megahertz, up to... 2.3 gigs for 40 megahertz up to about 5 gigs, maybe 4.8 gigs for 80 megahertz. And then the 80 plus 80 provided up to 9.6 gigs. Uh, also eight spatial streams or MIMO streams, excuse me, uh, in this particular technology as well. Now there are other standards. Um, there are uh, uh, actually several different standards that are proposed. Uh, some of them actually even proposed for the future. Uh, 802.11ba, for example, uh, which is uh, uh, you know in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz range, uh, and it offers uh, a very narrow bandwidth, 4.06, but uh, you know this is a a low bandwidth wireless, up to 62.5 kilobits a second. 250 kilobits a second uh, data rates. So obviously not going to be used for, for Wi-Fi. Uh, and then we also have Li-Fi. Uh, Li-Fi is um, light fidelity, uh, using light to transmit data, um, and which was actually kind of developed in the mid-2000s. 
uh, like 2010, 2011. Uh, and it looks like they're looking to establish a standard, uh, not infrared, we're not talking about infrared in this case. Um, this is the 60 gigahertz or 60,000 gigahertz, excuse me, uh, frequency um, to the 70, 790,000 uh, gigahertz frequency, but 802.11bb, uh, as in bravo, bravo. All right. So, uh, you know, that's kind of a, a brief breakdown of each of these. Uh, now, we don't get into this class, although I did talk about this a lot in my CCNA wireless class when I was doing this, uh, as to how we actually achieve the different bandwidths based on the different modulation techniques, how the data is actually encoded, how it's decoded, and so on. Um, I don't think for this particular class that we need to talk about that, um, but uh, it, is, it is definitely something that I would suggest you, you take a look at because we're talking about using essentially the same frequencies to generate you know, exponentially more data or more throughput, I should say, for these frequencies. And it all has to do with how, those, uh, how, the, how the waveforms are analyzed, uh, you know, with, with different uh, quadrature amplitude modulated signals uh, or even just uh, encoding of the ones and zeros and so on. All right. Now, uh, let me just briefly mention, hopefully we'll see a picture of this a little bit later on, the, the, um, the graphical representation, of you will, of the 2.4 gigahertz band. So imagine you have, uh, in the United States, 11 channels, all right? Channel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Each of those channels are 22 megahertz wide with 5 megahertz gap between the start of one channel and the start of the next channel. So let's say, for example, channel 1 is 2.412 um, uh, gigahertz. That's the center frequency. That means that channel two is going to be 2.417 uh, because it's going to be five uh, megahertz um, separated. Uh, and then channel three is 2.422, uh, just adding five each time. Channel four is 2.47 or 27 and so on. That means to say that the only channels that don't overlap in this particular case are channels one, six, and 11. There's actually five megahertz of, of, uh, of spatial separation between the center frequency, actually the edge of the, the end of the channel one and the beginning of channel six. All right. Um, hopefully we'll see a, a, um, a, represent, a visual representation. It's always nice to kind of see a visual representation of that uh, rather than just talking about it. All right. In addition to having these standards that are proposed by IEEE, we also have regulatory domains for legal compliance. Uh, domain codes are specific to the country itself. Different countries have different levels of allowable transmit power, time that a channel can actually be occupied, uh, and the actual available channels themselves. Uh, the United States, Canada has their separate one, Europe, which is ETSI, Spain, France, Japan, China, they all have their own regulatory domains. And we will get into what some of those regulatory domains are in a little bit. So the book kind of describes uh, all of these different standards here. I'm not going to go back and reread these things, but uh, I did kind of paraphrase most of what you're seeing in, in the book here. All right. So now let's start to talk about some of the enhancements that we see with wireless and what those enhancements provide with regard to how those uh, frequencies can be better, uh, better utilized. The first thing we see here is something called MIMO or M-I-M-O, which stands for multiple input and multiple output. This is actually a way for us to multiply the capacity of a radio link by using multiple transmission 
and multiple receiving antennas to exploit what normally would be considered uh, something detrimental to wireless, multipath propagation. So what is multipath propagation? Basically, as I transmit a signal, that means that signals are kind of going out in different directions, and those signals are bouncing off of objects and, and passing through different objects and so on. What's going to end up happening is that on the receiving side, the radio signals reaching the receiving antenna are going to get there by two or more paths. Uh, and normally this would cause multipath distortion, right? Uh, or multipath interference. So you would have signals that might be uh, directly out of phase, so they would cancel each other out, or you would have some sort of phase shifting, uh, which would cause down fading, uh, where you have one waveform that's kind of partially negating the, the uh, uh, ability of another waveform, uh, which is uh, down fading. And then we might even have up fading if we have two waveforms that are, that are um, uh, synchronous that would generate a, a, a stronger signal, right? But this generally, this multipath propagation or multipath interference would cause the radio signal to become too weak uh, and the system would not be able to identify uh, or rep, uh, you know, represent the data. That's often, uh, often why we have multiple antennas, particularly on, on traditional access points or kind of our first access points. We had these uh, dipole antennas or multiple antennas. It wasn't because we had one antenna for transmitting or one antenna for receiving. We had these antennas uh, to be able to select a signal that was uh, either better um, than, than another signal and so on to deal with this multipath um, distortion. Okay, So MIMO actually takes advantage of this multipath propagation. Uh, and it's really become a critical component to the efficiency of standards like 802.11n, 802.11ac, uh, WiMAX, LTE, and so on. All right. The general concept is actually depicted on the diagram here. We have something called MRC, we have something called beamforming, and we have something called spatial multiplexing. So it's important to kind of understand these, uh, these different uh, technologies. Uh, MIMO actually is divided into three subcategories. Pre-coding, which we're probably not gonna talk about, spatial multiplexing, which we will talk about, and diversity coding. Again, something that we're probably not going to talk about. Let's focus on spatial multiplexing first. Right? Spatial multiplexing requires MIMO antennas. It's very, very important. In a spatial multiplexing scenario, we have a high rate signal that's split into multiple lower rate streams, and then each data stream is transmitted at a different transmit antenna in the same frequency channel. If these signals arrive at the receiver antenna array with uh, significantly different spatial signatures and the receiver has accurate CSI, it can actually separate these streams into parallel channels. And then the maximum number of spatial streams uh, would then determine basically what the, the quality of that signal would be. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of rephrase that and restate that again because I want to make sure that you understand what the benefit of spatial multiplexing is, especially when we're using MIMO technology. But before I do that, I, I want to talk, uh, go back to where we were before, right? 802.11b, 802.11g, before we had these, these additional features that MIMO provides. When uh, I'm receiving a signal, all right, and again, we're talking about an access point that might have multiple antennas, we have something called antenna diversity, which provides us the ability to create or at least receive a more robust signal with less fading 
by taking advantage of the differences in the signal that's received by the antennas that are actually spaced a very specific distance apart. They're actually spaced a half of a wavelength or more apart from each other. All right. Uh, now, there are three approaches that can be used for receiver diversity. You can do something like selection combining, where we choose the signal from the received antenna with the strongest signal to noise ratio. You can do equal gain combining, where we basically sum the magnitudes from each of the antennas. And you can do something called maximum ratio combining, where we apply weights to each channel to align the phase from each antenna, which allows us then to adjust the magnitude and so on. All right. So again, these are terms that we see uh, on the slide here, but it's very important that you understand uniquely what's different between, between each of these. Interference in the wireless path in the transmission are always going to, or is always going to infect, infect, affect the integrity and the quality of the radio frequency. All right. The remedy for this interference, the remedy for multipath issues uh, was to be able to either combine or choose the best quality signal from multiple receivers. All right. Now, if we take that a step further, uh, you can build a system that can be actually made more reliable by using combinational algorithms along with multiple radios on the transmit side and the receiving side of the system. And this is really what the essence of the 802.11n and AC standards are. Okay? In 802.11a, b, and g, we had single in, single out system, or what we call SISL. We use a antenna diversity to combat the effects of multipath distortion, but we still only had one single antenna that was sending and one single antenna that was receiving. With multiple input, multiple output, or multiple in or multiple out, we take advantage of the fact that the AP has multiple radio arrangements and use multipath to increase system reliability and performance. And we see this. Uh, in fact, in some of the newer access points, you could have up to eight separate radios that are contained in one actual access point. All right. The uh, number of transmitters which we call TX, uh, the number of receivers, RX. Uh, this is what's going to translate in, in terms of the nomenclature, if you will, to the MIMO technology. So if you see, for example, a 3x3, three 3x3, three, three three, right? 3 means that the AP has three transmitters, three receivers, and is actually capable of three different spatial streams or different radio chains. Uh, now, it is actually possible to have an odd number of transmitters and an even number of receivers uh, and uh, an incongruent, if you will, number of radio chains, but most systems use an equivalent number of transmitters and re uh, receivers that will actually correspond to those radio chains. A radio chain, uh, or those are just basically the connections between a given transmitter and a receiver pair. Uh, and 802.11ac actually allows for up to eight radio chains. The use of multiple radios gives us the possibility of having multiple users on one access point. Uh, 802.11ac, for example, multiple user or MUMIMO is an example of this. We have up to eight separate users that can actually simultaneous, simultaneously connect to a particular AP rather than each waiting for its, its time, if you will, to associate to the AP and transmit in its turn. All right, 
this will obviously uh, provide much greater throughput uh, with high user density for that particular AP. All right. Now, I, I keep reiterating this, but I'm going to state it again. A technique that takes advantage of MIMO is spatial multiplexing, or uh, you might see it actually referred to as spatial diversity multiplexing. The AP actually uses the multiple radios in this case to transmit separate segments of the message to the receiver, which again directly relates to throughput. Multiple unique streams of data are actually sent between the transmitter and the receiver. Depending on the number of radio train, uh, chains or the number of streams, that's going to correspond to the number of unique data streams that are possible within the particular access point. Spatial multiplexing is actually different from antenna diversity. Uh, in this case, multiple antennas are actually used to determine which will receive or transmit the best signal, referring to, of course, the diversity option. All right, again, this was all, all used pre-802.11. All right. Now, uh, there is another uh, element that was created, uh, uh, STBC, or space-time block coding. Uh, I don't need to, we don't need to get into the specifics of that. Uh, or CSD, uh, cyclic shift diversity. Again, we don't need to get into that. But let's talk about beamforming, since it is mentioned on the diagram here. Transmit beamforming is another advanced technique that allows the access point to use multiple transmission antennas as a phased array. So that means that we can transmit signals uh, to an endpoint in the hopes, well not the hopes, but in a calculated way so that those signals arrive to the, to, to the uh, 802.11n client in phase, which means we're going to get up fading in that particular case. A phased array is basically just an antenna system that controls the phase and the amplitude of the data transmissions to the antenna array so that we can actually shape the transmitted data into a directional beam. Uh, and this is uh, TXBF is what you would see it documented as in a lot of different uh, documentation. All right, uh, the transmitter itself is called the beam former and it relies on the data received by the receiver which is the beam for me, so that we can then adjust the phase and amplitude of the transmitted data uh, to get its uh, uh, greatest uh, effect, if you will. So let's take a look at, uh, from the book's perspective at least, uh, a visual representation of this maximal ratio combining uh, and uh, beam forming and spatial multiplexing. So here's the, the, the uh, visual representation of MRC. Uh, it says here it uses, uh, uh, well, energy from different uh, antennas. Uh, the top one is not MRC, right? That's just a standard SISO transmission. The bottom one is the uh, maximal uh, ratio combining rep uh, example. Uh, by using spatial multiplexing and by using transmit beamforming, uh, because we do have multiple transmitters and multiple receivers, uh, MRC is, is uh, really just an extension of that, if you will. It's actually the counterpart to transmit beamforming, uh, but it takes place on the receiver side, not the transmitter side. All right. Uh, it doesn't matter, uh, by the way, whether the sender is 802.11n capable or not, even though this particular diagram describes it that way. All right, the receiver has to have multiple antennas to be able to use this particular feature. Uh, and, and of course, that kind of, a, you know, is going to directly relate to the fact that we're running 802.11n because most stations that uh, do have multiple antennas are running 802.11n. The MRC algorithm really just takes a look at the signals that are being received. 
and it runs a calculation to determine how to optimally combine the energy that each of the antennas is receiving so that we can then get that signal strength, uh, uh, you know, through the use of up fading to a level that is um, beneficial to the, to the receiving client. So in other words, we're just uh, analyzing the signals that were received from the antennas. We send the signal to the transcoder. Uh, they then will in turn, the transcoder will in turn ensure that those signals are in phase, uh, which ultimately is going to result in um, the signals themselves, uh, you know, being, well, passively amplified, if you will. All right. So again, the receiver itself must have multiple antennas to do this uh, and so on. All right. Now, this feature is not related to multipath. Uh, the, the whole concept of multipath is where one antenna receives reflected signals that are ultimately out of phase, and then that out of phase result is typically going to be destructive to the signal quality in the form of down fading. All right. MRC uses a signal that comes from two or three physically distinct antennas, uh, and not not reflected signals, but actually signals that are generated from different antennas and it combines them so that each signal that gets received on each antenna are going to be in phase. So we have to evaluate the state of the channel for the signal that is receiving, uh, uh, that's being received on each antenna and then we're going to choose the best received signal for each symbol, uh, ignoring the pieces of the waves on one chain that that maybe is interfered with or doesn't, we don't read well, all right? This basically ultimately is going to increase the quality of the reception. Uh, if you have three chains, for example, you have three chances to read each symbol uh, that, that you receive, minimizing the chances that you're gonna get that degraded signal from interference uh, because it would be unlikely you would get that interference on, from all three receivers. Multipath still matters here. Uh, because of multipath, each antenna might still receive reflected signals that are out of phase, uh, and they would, uh, you know, ultimately result in some sort of degraded signal. But the main advantage of MRC in this particular case is because each antenna is physically separated from the other. The received signal on each antenna is going to be diversely affected by multipath because they're physically in different locations. All right, if I add all those signals together, the result will still be a closer, uh, a closer representation of the original wave that was sent by the sender. And the impact of multipath is gonna be a lot less critical. All right, so the next thing we talk about, of course, is beam forming. Uh, I talked a little bit about this, right? This is uh, used when the receiver only has typically one antenna, uh, and we have a, a, a receiver that's kind of in a fixed location, if you will. They're not moving fast, or and they're in, in typically an indoor environment. All right? It's still an 802.11n capable transmitter that can perform this TX beamforming. Uh, it allows the 802.11 capable transmitter to basically adjust the phase of each signal that is transmitted on each of its antennas so that those reflected signals arrive in phase with the receive antenna. All right. The nice thing about this particular technique is that it doesn't require an 802.11 client because, again, we just have one single receive antenna uh, and if the signals are arriving in phase, we don't have to do any calculation. There's no algorithm that has to run to be able to identify or, or put those signals back in phase. All right. Uh, another component uh, that was introduced is something called Cisco Client Link. Uh, 802.11n originally specified how the MIMO technology 
should have been used based on its design to improve the signal to noise ratio, uh, client link kind of works to help fix the problems of mixed client networks uh, by making sure that some of the older clients operate at the same data rates or at least at the best data rates if they're near other clients that support maybe one or two or three different spatial streams. All right. It's a, it's a signaling processing enhancement uh, that, was, that was introduced. Spatial multiplexing, again, which we've talked about a couple of different times. Uh, both of the, the sender and the receiver have to be 802.11n uh, or AC capable. Uh, and you have to have at least two receivers and at least one single transmitter per band, per frequency, uh, to allow us to effectively use the reflective signals um, that would normally be detrimental to a legacy protocol. All right. With spatial multiplexing, the single stream is broken up into multiple individual streams. I, I kind of discussed this previously. They're transmitted from a different antenna using uh, its own transmitter, but because there is space between each antenna, each signal ultimately is going to follow a different path to the receiver. Uh, and this is where we get that spatial diversity. The radio can then send different data streams from the other radios. Uh, or the all, you know, the other option would be all radios would send data, this, uh, you know, all the data at the same time. Well, it's not another option. That's what would happen. We can still send the data at the same time. Uh, you know, which is uh, part of the algorithm and the calculation within the algorithm. The receiver has multiple antennas as well, each with its own radio, and then each receiver radio independently decodes those arriving signals. Each radio uh, received signal gets combined with the signals from the other radios, uh, again, through algorithms and different calculations. The received signal uh, is going to be a much better signal than if I had a single antenna or even with TX beamforming. Using multiple streams allows devices to send redundant information with a lot greater reliability, a lot greater volume, uh, and which is going to result in greater throughput uh, or better quality of information or even both. Right. So let's say, for example, the station has two antennas. The data is broken up into two streams uh, that two transmitters send at the same frequency. The receiver says, using my three receive antennas with my multipath and math skills, I can recognize the two streams that are transmitted at the same frequency because the transmitters have spatial separation. All right, obviously we know this is going to provide much more efficient Wi-Fi transmissions. There can even be a difference between the sender and receiver. If a transmitter can emit over three antennas, it's said to have three data streams. When it can receive and combine signals from three antennas, we talk about that as having three receive chains. The combination is, in this case, would be that three by three that we talked about previously. And you can have two by two, you can have four by four, you can have eight by eight, uh, all having different spatial streams. Two by two is two spatial streams, four by four is four spatial streams, eight by eight is eight spatial streams. All right. In 802.11ac, we allow more data by incre increasing the number of spatial streams. So, for example, an 80 megahertz channel with one stream provides a throughput of about 300 megabits per second. Eight streams provide a throughput of about 2.4 gigs per second. And if I jump that up to a 160 megahertz wide channel, that's going to allow up to 860 or so megabits per second in one stream, up to 6.9 gigabits per second if I'm using eight streams. 
Okay? All right. Now, the last thing we'll talk about here before we wrap up this section here is multiple user MIMO technology. In 802.11, any device can transmit multiple spatial streams at once, but only to a single host, only to a single address. All right? These are all individually address frames, which means only a single device is able to receive. This is SUMIMO. 802.11ac created this MUMIO algorithm where the AP is actually able to use all of its antenna resources to transmit multiple frames up to four different clients at the same time over the same frequency spectrum. So to send data to user one in this case, we form a strong beam towards user one. So the lobe, the, the, the big blue lobe, if you will, uh, is gonna represent the energy that's uh, uh, going to user one, but we're gonna minimize the amount of energy that we're gonna send to user two and user three. Uh, this is called null steering, by the way. And that's what the blue notches represent. All right. Uh, AP is sending data to user two. We're gonna form a beam to user two, and then we're gonna do the null steering to users one and three. That's the red curve. Uh, and then the yellow curve, uh, again, user three, and we're going to do the null steering for users one and two. All right. So we have a few questions here at the end. Let's go through those questions, and then we'll wrap up our entire lesson by talking about wireless component roles in the last section. So which 802.11 standard has a data rate of 600 megabits per second? 600 megabits per second. That is going to be 802.11n, right? Remember, uh, AC is going to be 1.3 gigs up to 6.9 gigs, uh, and uh, 802.11ax, uh, 4.8 gigs. All right. Which four features correctly describe the 802.11n standard? All right. We did multiple input, multiple output. Uh, it does have backwards compatibility with 802.11 B and G and A. All right. We can uh, do channel bonding, but we'll talk about the different bonding techniques that we have in a little bit. One of the capabilities is definitely block acknowledgement. Now block acknowledgement was actually part of the 802.11e scheme. Uh, and it improved the media access control efficiency by hand, or identifying how we can uh, handle the acknowledgement. So instead of transmitting an individual acknowledgement for every MPD, uh, MPDU, uh, the uh, MPDU is just the um, protocol data unit, if we will, uh, that we're sending and receiving. Uh, we can send multiple MPDUs, and then those can be acknowledged together using a single BA frame or block acknowledgement frame. All right. Now, this was uh, uh, created in 802.11e as an optional scheme, but then 802.11 uh, amendments ratified in 2009 uh, made it mandatory that uh, all 802.11n capable devices uh, would support this functionality. Now the channel bonding in this case is not correct because we do not use 22 megahertz wide channels with the 802.11 standard. We use 20 megahertz wide channels with the 802.11 standard. And yes, you can do channel bonding uh, to get to say 40 megahertz wide channels and so on. Uh, but that's, uh, that's not what they said here. The last choice is packet aggregation in this particular case. Now, this is a feature that allows communicating on a shared link in our wireless frequency with a minimal time slot 
for efficiency re uh, reasons, benefiting from filling up the time slot with data. Uh, it is actually part of 802.11e, it's part of 802.11n, and AC as well. And the idea is that we're increasing the throughput with, fragment, uh, with frame aggregation. Every frame that we transmit in 802.11 has a lot of overhead. Right? We have our radio level headers, we have our media access control frame headers, our interframe spacing, acknowledgements, and so on. At the highest data rate, this overhead can take up more bandwidth, actually, than the payload data frame itself. So to address this particular issue, in 802.11, we define two types of frame aggregation, what we call MAC service data unit aggregation, and MAC protocol data unit aggregation. Uh, the idea here in, in a nutshell is that we're taking several data frames and we're putting them into one large data frame. All right, and that's going to result in a higher amount of throughput of actual uh, payload data as opposed to the overhead. So packet aggregation would be the last choice here. Which three of the following AC, uh, which, which three of the following are 802.11 AC Wave 1 features? Well, we know for sure it's going to operate in the 5 gigahertz spectrum. Uh, that's definitely one of those uh, components of 802.11 AC, Wave 1 at least. Now, we also have the use of optionally at least 160 megahertz wide channels we have to have at least 80 megahertz wide channels um, as compared to the 40 megahertz uh, maximum in 802.11n uh, we have a support for up to eight spatial streams in this particular case so one to three would not be correct i mean even 802.11n supports four spatial streams but we do have different modulation techniques. We have 256 QAM, quadrature amplitude modulation, uh, with rate 3 fourths and 5 6 uh, added to uh, other optional modes of 64 QAM. Uh, that, that was what we would see typically in, in 802.11n. All right. Uh, some vendors will go all the way up to 1,024 QAM or QAM, Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. Uh, it's just uh, basically a digital modulation technique um, which divides up the, uh, uh, the spectrum, if you will, into a graph and, and looks at amplitudes and positions on the graph and so on to be able to identify uh, the, um, the uh, modulation, right? Uh, we have a constellation diagram, uh, and uh, the constellation points get arranged kind of in this square grid, if you will. There's an equal uh, vertical and horizontal spacing between them. Um, and then as we hit each of the frequencies, we can identify a, a bit pattern uh, for those particular frequencies. So like 16 qualm would have you know, uh, 16 different constellation points, each representing four bits each, okay? Uh, we're not really getting into uh, phase shift keying um, and how QAM works in this class. I do talk about that quite a bit in my CCNA wireless class, which is also on our YouTube channel. But 256 QAM would be the next answer here. All right. Which three features correctly describe MIMO? Uh, better immunity to noise, definitely. All right. Reflected signals improve the signal as opposed to what we saw with just single input, single output. Switches between diversity antennas, that would be single input, single output. Aggregates all the received signals, absolutely. Which three statements about MIMO correctly describe its benefits? 
MIMO provides better receive sensitivity for a stationary client by using beamforming. Uh, negative, that would be spatial multiplexing, right? MIMO provides better transmit sensitivity for the AP by using maximum ratio combining. Yeah. Uh, better receive sensitivity means higher data rate at a given distance. That is absolutely true. A better transmit sensitivity means higher data rates. No, it would be receive sensitivity. Uh, and combined with channel bonding, MIMO increases data throughput. Absolutely. Okay. Which three characteristics correctly describe transmit beamforming? Typically used when there is more than one receiving antenna. That is absolutely true. Remember, when we were talking about the differences here, we were talking about the differences between uh, maximum ratio combining, which uh, allows the use of a single antenna, as opposed to uh, beam forming, which uses a single antenna. I think I actually missed... Uh, Mismarked one here. Uh, MIMO provides receive sensitivity stationary client um, by using beamforming. No, that probably wouldn't be correct. Remember, spatial multiplexing is what uses multiple antennas and multiple streams, whereas beamforming uses a single antenna. Uh, so this would not be the case in this particular case. The 802.11 and capable transmitter adjusts the phase of the signal so that the reflected signal arrives in phase. Correct, because again, we're going to a single antenna, so we have to make sure that the signals are in phase as they arrive. Can be applied on even legacy clients. Yep, that's true. Uh, explicit beamforming requires that the same capabilities in the AP and the 802.11n client. Absolutely true. Okay. All right. Uh, which three characteristics correctly describe maximum ratio combining? All right. Uh, now, again, maximum ratio combining uh, is where I have multiple transmitters, but I only have a single receiver. Uh, the AP combines energies from multiple receiving chains. Uh, yes, the receiver AP must have multiple antennas uh, for this feature. That is true in this case. Uh, any receiver AP can use this feature. That is not true. The sending client must be 802.11n capable. That is true. Even though it doesn't have to have multiple antennas, it still has to be 802.11n compatible. Uh, the receiver, which is the AP in this case, evaluates the state of the channel for each signal that's received. It will choose the best received signal. No, the combining word in the name itself obviously implies that we're combining signals, not using the best signal. Okay. What type of AP supports MUMIO? That is going to be AC, 802.11 AC. Okay. We do support MIMO on N, but not multiple user MIMO. That's something that's going to have to be done on AC. All right. So we'll wrap up this section. We've got one more section left, and then uh, identifying wireless component roles. And then we'll wrap up this very lengthy introduction to wireless technology. All right, in our last section, we're just going to go ahead and talk about uh, the role of a client in the wireless environment, the role of the access points, even the role of the wireless LAN controller in our enterprise uh, wireless network. What we're looking at here is a, the process of client AP uh, association, right? Uh, all wireless capable devices are called stations in our wireless environment. Wireless stations come in lots of different formats, right? It could be a laptop, it could be a tablet, it could be a phone, uh, it could be an operating system. But these wireless stations have to have capabilities that coincide with the access points capability. An AP is a basically a hub 
Uh, it's more like a bridge, but it relays communication from a wireless device and it allows those devices to speak at a particular time, right? Uh, on a particular channel, which, uh, and then that information is then relayed uh, to the final destination. The AP itself uses a very specific layer two addressing scheme of the wireless frame to be able to forward the upper layer information to the network backbone or back to the wireless space towards another wireless machine if we're talking from wireless client to wireless client. If the destination is an ethernet device, we have to bridge between the 802.11 uh, framing type to the 802.3 framing type, okay? Now there are three 802.11 connected states between a wireless station and an access point not authenticated or associated, authenticated but not yet associated, and then finally authenticated and associated. So association always occurs after authentication. All right, and in order for a mobile station to be able to communicate you know, by sending data and then the AP bridges that data, the access point or the client itself must be authenticated and associated to the access point itself. So there's a series of 802.11 management frames that go back and forth to be able to go through this process. Step number one, as we see depicted in the diagram, the mobile station sends out a probe request. And the purpose of the probe request is to discover all the 802.11 networks, uh, their proximity, uh, the RSSI, the SNR, etc. Uh, that probe request uh, advertises the mobile station's data rates. Uh, if it's an N device or an AC device, a G device, an A device, or whatever. Because the probe request is sent from the station to the all ones broadcast address, FF, 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 all APs will receive that and will respond to that particular probe request. The APs receiving the probe request check to see if the mobile station has at least one common supported data rate for that particular AP. If they have compatible data rates, the probe response then gets sent advertising the SSID, which is the service set identifier or the wireless network name, the data rates that are supported by the access point, the encryption types, if encryption is required, and other 802.11 capabilities of the access point. The mobile device at this point chooses the compatible networks from those probe responses, uh, and then that's going to be based primarily on, uh, well, it could be based on a lot of different things, but it could be based on encryption type or other compatibilities, right? But once a compatible network is discovered, we attempt what we call a low-level 802.11 authentication with those compatible APs. Now keep in mind that 802.11 authentication is not the same as WPA, WPA2, or 802.1x authentication, which occur after the station is authenticated and associated. 802.11 authentication frames were designed for web encryption, uh, but that security scheme generally has been debunked as secure it's insecure, it's been deprecated. But because of this, all 802.11 authentication frames are still open and they have to succeed. So in step number four, we send this low level 802.11 authentication frame to the AP, setting the authentication to open uh, and then uh, generating sequence number of hex 0001. Step number five, the AP receives the authentication frame and then it re responds to the mobile workstation or the mobile device with authentication frame uh, set to open indicating uh, also the next sequence of hex 0002. If the AP receives any frame other than an authentication or probe request from a mobile device that is not authenticated, it responds with a deauthentication frame, placing the mobile device into an unauthenticated 
an unassociated state because it hasn't progressed through the appropriate steps, right? The station has to begin the association process from the low level authentication step. Now at this point, this mobile device is authenticated, but not yet associated. All right. Some dot 11 capabilities will allow a mobile workstation to low level authenticate to more than one access point. This will allow us to speed up the association process if I'm moving or roaming from one access point to another. The mobile station can actually be 802.11 authenticated to those APs, but it can only be actively associated and transferring data to a single access point, which makes sense. In step number seven, once the station determines which AP it's going to want to associate to, it sends the association request to the AP, uh, which contains, by the way, the encryption type uh, and the other 802.11 capabilities. Once the AP receives the frame from the mobile station, if it's authenticated and not yet associated, it will respond again with a disassociation frame, moving that device into an authenticated but unassociated state. If the configuration or if the components in the association request match the capability of the access point, the AP is going to create an association ID for that particular mobile endpoint and it's going to respond with an association response, a success message, uh, in essence basically granting network access to the mobile station. And then the final step we can, uh, once we're successfully associated, we can start to transmit our data. All right. So that's kind of a breakdown of that process, if you will. Now, there is something else called a split MAC function. This typically we will see in uh, a unified wireless environment where I have autonomous, excuse me, non autonomous APs, lightweight access points that are associated to wireless LAN controller. All right. The controller-based architecture actually is what gives us the ability of splitting some of the dot 11 functions between the access point, which is then allowed to process all the real-time portions of the dot 11 protocol, and the wireless LAN controller, which typically would handle all of the non-time sensitive components. All right, this is what the split MAC uh, model is, right? What are some of the things that the access point would process in a split Mac, split Mac environment? Uh, handshaking between the client and the AP, if I'm transmitting a frame, the beacon frames, uh, buffering or transmitting frames for a client in power save mode. Uh, let me see, responding to probe requests from clients, forwarding notifications of received probe requests, to the wireless LAN controller. These are all things that the access point would do. Providing real-time signal quality information to the wireless LAN controller so we can do our radio resource management. Monitoring the radios for noise, interference, other wireless interferers or non-wireless interferers. Uh, monitoring the presence of other APs and so on. All right, and then the encryption and decryption of the actual frames themselves. Remember, the AP talks to the controller using a DTLS tunnel, uh, which is part of CAPWAP. All right. All the remaining functions that we see in a wireless environment where sensitivity, time sensitivity is not a concern, uh, those are going to be WLC enabled components, right? So authentication, either pre shared key authentication, extensible authentication, radio frequency management. Um, you know, RF space, uh, client IP addressing, roaming, layer two or layer three roaming, quality of service implementations, AP management, which includes setting up the VLANs, the IP addresses, uh, image management, you know, for the APs themselves and so on. All right. Now, wireless LAN controllers traditionally have always been kind of dedicated hardware platforms running what we call Cisco AIR OS, that's A-I-R-E-O-S. Uh, and they're really 
central to the entire deployment. But we have cloud-based controllers. Uh, we have hardware appliances running iOS XE software, VMs that run AeroS, uh, WISMs, wireless uh, service modules, uh, or integrated switches. The switches, uh, integrated switches pieces kind of going away, but that's the converged wireless stuff that Cisco has. All right. So what is the control and provisioning of a wireless access point protocol? Uh, Cisco used to use a lightweight access point protocol, LWAP, but they've moved to the open standard protocol that basically allows the wireless LAN controller to manage the access points. Uh, the encrypted tunnel, the DTLS tunnel that exists between the access point and the controller is where the CAPLAP information is processed. Uh, there's a, a process of discovering access points and controllers, joining controllers, pushing configurations to the AP, uh, pushing firmware updates from the wireless LAN controller, gathering information about security policies and security enforcement, uh, radio resource management, etc. All right. CAPWAP actually separates the control plane and the data plane. So the AP and the controller build this DTLS tunnel uh, which is the control plane, uh, and then the wireless LAN controller messages. Those control plane messages are used to basically support wireless station access, wireless station authentication, mobility, etc. The client data is actually encapsulated inside of the CAPWAP header that contains all of the information about the client's RSSI, the signal to noise ratio, that's also going to be sent to the wireless LAN controller, which forwards the data as needed, right? As the device is configured. Now, the data plane itself is actually not encrypted by default, but you can encrypt the data plane using DTLS as well. All right. Now, there are some uh, differences between, say, an MC. Uh, and an MA, master uh, mobility agent versus a mobility controller, in this centralized architecture. Uh, the mobility controller and the mobility agent uh, basically run uh, the same, or, or could run on the same wireless LAN controller, or we could split that functionality. What is the responsibility of an MA? The MA has the responsibility to terminate all the CAPWAP tunnels. It maintains the client database. Uh, if I have tens of thousands of clients that are associating, deassociating, roaming, moving around in the environment, we need to maintain a client database, and that is one of the primary functions of the MA. The MA also configures and enforces things like QoS policies for the clients, security policies for the clients, and so on. A mobility controller provides mobility management tasks. So things like radio resource management, WIPs or wireless intrusion prevention, guest access, roaming, etc. All right. So these are functions that uh, really kind of make sense if you're looking at the system as a whole. All right, the mobility agent reports local and roamed client information or client states, if you will, to the mobility controller, but the mobility controller builds a database of the client stations across all of the mobility agents. All right, now we have a POP, which is our point of presence, and we have a POA, which is our point of attachment. All right, the POP is where the wireless client user is seen to be in the actual wired portion of the network. So that's your point of presence. That makes sense, right? If you're on a wired network, an ARP might have been done for that particular wireless user. It would show the wireless user as part of, uh, you know, kind of an 802.1Q trunk, if you will, that comes from the switch that points towards the wireless LAN controller because all the client's data is sent back to the controller, all right? That ends up becoming the location of the wireless user, all right? You actually will be able to know 
if a wireless user is roaming somewhere. But from the wired network's point of view, the user is at the wireless controller on that dot one q trunk. So the POP is what anchors the client's IP address. As the client moves from one AP to the next, it could actually move beyond a wired subnet. So the network needs to keep the wireless user on the same subnet with the same IP address as it roams. Otherwise, we would have to disassociate and reassociate. Okay, uh, And that would be pretty detrimental for real-time applications. So the network uses the POP concept to kind of anchor the client's IP address. Now, before a client roams, the POA and the POP are exactly the same. So conversely speaking, the POA is basically where the client AP's CAFWAP tunnel terminates. All right, if the wireless user roams, the point of attachment may move from wireless LAN controller to wireless LAN controller, but the point of presence will stay fixed in a particular location. All right. There's obviously a lot more that we could talk about in this particular case. Um, and we'll probably get into it as we go into some of our discoveries and we start to do our configurations. Remember, we still have lots and lots of wireless stuff to talk about. All right. So let's go through the review here. Which device in a split Mac architecture is for responsible for association and reassociation? Okay. That would be our controller-based AP. Again, the real-time stuff, right? The real-time components are going to be what the AP handles. All right. Now, this can be a little bit confusing, this particular question, because authentication, pre-shared key, EAP authentication, that happens at the controller. All right, but association occurs before authentication. So that's why we say that that's going to happen at the AP. All right, what are three features that correctly describe the CAPWAP protocol? Uh, it is an open protocol, and it does allow us to manage our wireless access points. So we'll check that box. By default, the data plane messages are exchanged between the controller and the AP across an encrypted tunnel. That is not true, it's the opposite. By default, control plane messages are never exchanged between the client and the controller. Um, that's not true. APs are authenticated before being able to download any configuration. Uh, yes, that would be true. Client data is encapsulated within CAPWAP header that contains valuable information about the RSSI and the signal to noise ratio. Absolutely true, okay? By the way, this, this last one here, uh, I paused for a minute because I wanted to make sure, we're not talking about clients in this case. We're talking about access points. Which two options about the MA and MC are correct? The MC is responsible for terminating the CAPWAP tunnels. It all, also maintains the client database. Uh, no, the MA is the one that terminates the CAPWAP tunnels and maintains the database. So we'll check the second box here. The MC provides mobility management tasks, roaming, intrusion prevention, guest access. That is absolutely true. Okay. And they can be uh, uh, co-resident on the same controller. Which the characteristics correctly describe wireless point of attachment? All right. So moves with user AP connectivity. Yes, not the point of presence. That's what anchors the client to a specific subnet. Use for packet capture analysis, nope. Use for quality uh, of service policy application, nope. Use for routing policy application, use for security policy application. Is the wireless LAN controller where the client AP CAPWAP tunnel is terminated? That is true. All right. So what else are we talking about here? Uh, it would have to be routing in this case, right? Because we're talking about the client moving from one AP to another AP, which, by the way, could even mean that we're changing from one controller to the next. Okay? 
The last thing we have is just our general summary challenge. Match the RF signal description with its name. Okay, the size of the cycle pattern, how often the signal is seen, and the strength of the signal. Well, we know the strength of the signal is the amplitude. How often the signal is seen is the frequency. And the size of the cycle pattern is the wavelength. So trough to trough, crest to crest, or zero crossing to zero crossing. Which one of these represents the best signal to noise ratio? So we have 25 minus 10, which results in a, mi uh, a uh, minus 15. So minus 25 minus a minus 10 equals a minus 15. Our SSI of 50 dBm minus 25. So that's a minus 25. 70 dBm minus 95. So now we're talking about a, remember a plus integer is the best minus 70 minus minus 95 which is equal to plus 95 so that would be a plus 25 and then minus 95 and minus 95 would be a zero so the third option is our best option remember a positive integer is what we want to see i know it's it's counterintuitive right you look at uh uh, minus 10 dB of noise, but that's actually more noise than signal. So this is the best option in this particular case. To which segment of the RF spectrum do Wi-Fi networks belong? All right, it's going to be the radio side. All right, which is right before the microwave side, and these are the visible light spectrums or non-visible light spectrum. Which three types of antenna cause a butterfly effect, uh, Yagi, parabolic dish, and patch antennas. Dipole and Omni, again, are basically the same thing. Which three statements correctly describe Wi-Fi antennas? The two main families of antennas are omnidirectional and directional. That's true. A directional antenna radiates a different amount of energy as an omnidirectional antenna. Not necessarily a different amount of energy. It can be focused energy, but it's not necessarily a different amount of energy. The wave or electromagnetic signal speed travels at the speed of light, which is, yep, that's true. Although I'm not sure that has anything to do with an antenna specifically. The rating of a directional antenna in DBI will be higher. The rating of a directional antenna will be lower. The rating of a directional antenna is going to be higher. All right, higher gain. Okay. In which two environments is it best to use a parabolic dish? Uh, long distances, definitely, uh, and point to point. Certainly not in a hallway or a meeting room or indoors at all, for that matter. In which two environments is it best to use a Yagi antenna? Could be a long hallway. Uh, it could be uh, a narrow beam. Right. Actually, that would really be all that would apply there. In which two environments is it best to use a omnidirectional antenna? Covering a large area for sure. Uh, a conference room would be ex a good example of that. And match the antenna pane with its radiation pattern. So uh, if I'm from the side of the antenna, that is the uh, E plane, the elevation plane, and the top of the antenna is the horizontal plane. All right. So that wraps up this entire lesson. We will see you guys in the next lesson, which is examining wireless deployment options, where we're going to talk about really deployment overviews. What is an AP, autonomous AP deployment? What is centralized wireless LAN deployments? Flex Connect, uh, cloud deployments, cloud managed Meraki solutions, and so on. All right, so we'll see you guys 
in the next section.